got it. I got it. I got it. I got it. Somebody tell me. Good afternoon. I am Tom Hunt. Uh, I'm president of the school board this year on their behalf and that of our staff. Uh, I welcome you to the uh, February 18th, I mean, excuse me, yeah, 18th meeting of, the, of your RUSD school board. Um, and, uh, and on behalf, I should say, Dr. Hansen and our 5,000 RUSD employees. Uh, if you would like to review this meeting in Spanish, live stream, please follow the link provided on the agenda, which can be found on our website, www.rusd. I'm sorry, www.riversideunified.org. Apologize. We are broadcasting closed captions today. For those watching in live stream, can follow the live transcript of closed captioning through the link on YouTube. In accordance with orders from the California governor, the health officer of the county of Riverside, and guidelines of the Centers for Disease Control related to maintaining public health and safety in this interesting time, our meeting will be held online and there is no physical meeting location open to the public. We look forward to that day when, when that changes. The RUSD Board of Education encourages members of the public, you, to join the meeting electronically and to offer your voice and your insights and concerns and, and comments as they are important and valued by your board. Members of the public can find information on the board meeting agenda regarding how to submit your public comments. Now I'd like to introduce our Assistant Superintendent for Operations, Mr. Sergio San Martin, to provide this message in Spanish. Mr. San Martin. Thank you, President Hunt. Muy buenas tardes y bienvenidos a la reunión de la Junta de Educación del 18 de febrero del 2021. Si gustan ver esta reunión en español, sigan el enlace incluido dentro del orden del día, el cual pueden encontrar en nuestro sitio de línea en el www.riversideunified.org. Hoy también estamos transmitiendo con subtítulos para quienes están viendo la transmisión en vivo. Pueden seguir los subtítulos en vivo por medio del enlace en YouTube. La Junta respetará las recientes órdenes del gobernador de California, el oficial de salud del condado de Riverside y las órdenes del Centro de Control de Enfermedades. Esto es en relación con el mantenimiento de la salud y seguridad pública. Esta reunión se llevará a cabo solo en transmisión en línea y no habrá un lugar físico de reunión abierto al público. Le recomendamos a los miembros del público que se unan a la reunión electrónicamente. Su voz y su perspectiva son importantes. Los miembros del público pueden encontrar la información para cómo presentar sus comentarios públicos en el orden del día de la Junta de Educación. Muchas gracias. Back to you, Mr. Hunt. Thank you, Assistant Superintendent. I really appreciate that. Um, we're going to be going into closed session uh, pretty soon, and members of the public, we invite you uh, to have the opportunity to address the board on any items on closed session agenda. Uh, I'm going to call on Ms. Frosta, who, who air traffics everything for us, to ask if there's been any requests submitted for public comment on uh, closed session items. Ms. Frosto? Thank you, President Hunt. If you are a member of the public who has joined the Zoom call today to provide public comment on one of the items listed on the agenda for closed session only, please enter the queue now by using the raise hand function if you are logged in using the computer or star nine if you are using your phone to call in. Once again, the queue is only open for closed session items listed on the agenda and we'll give that just a moment. Thank you, Ms. Frost. While we're doing that, Ms. Frosta, could you to help them and do better than your president did on how they can go to YouTube and, and our site just to help folks uh, get prepared? I'd appreciate it. Or did I lose you? No, I'm here. So okay. for members who would like to uh, view the live stream, you may go to www.riversideunified.org and then you can find the link there. Thank you, ma'am, thank you. Let's just wait a couple more minutes and we'll, if we have any items so folks can, uh, can call in if, if need be. There are no members that are um, here for closed comment at this time. All right, then thank you, Ms. Frost, I appreciate that. So now at this time, the board will adjourn and go into closed session and uh, we'll be back for public session at 5.30. Thank you very much.
Okay, you're going to help me get on the, the right one. Hello, RUSD family. My name is Ken Mueller, and I am the Director of Maintenance Operations and Transportation for the Riverside Unified School District. The COVID-19 pandemic has created a start to this school year that is unlike any we have ever experienced. We have seen students and staff transition, adjust, and adapt in extraordinary ways to sustain positive learning at a distance. While we have seen you all manage this change in our lives so beautifully, we want to be prepared for the time that we can resume in-person instruction. Our teams have been hard at work to refine the procedures that will be used to ensure the safest possible environment for everyone when we do return to our school facilities. Safety continues to be the number one factor in all the decisions that we make as a district and it has resulted in many of the changes you will see in this video. We want to thank our teams and the community for your input and expertise in developing a comprehensive plan that will keep us safe and healthy. We could not do this without each and every one of you. Over the last several months, our teams have been working tirelessly to identify ways to keep our staff and students safe when we are permitted to return to in-person instruction. In this video, our goal is to illustrate the safety measures we will be utilizing and offer clarity as to what our campuses will look like as we prepare for the return to school. The areas we plan to address today are classrooms, cleaning and disinfecting, COVID-19 safety measures, nutrition services, and transportation. As students enter their classroom, they will see key changes that have been put in place to promote the health and safety of both our students and staff. Each room has been supplied with hand sanitizer. Antimicrobial soap is also stationed at every sink. Correspondent signage has been put in place promoting healthy hygiene habits. In some cases, non-essential furniture will be removed to maximize space and to allow social distancing between students and teachers. All desks will be supplied with shields and will be facing in the same direction. Disinfectant wipes will be provided in each classroom for teachers to use in intermittent times throughout the day. Our custodial teams will use electrostatic technology for disinfecting. This will increase efficiency and will be performed daily by our night custodial staff. Cleaning and disinfecting will include all desks and shields. Emphasis will be given on sanitizing high touch areas multiple times a day. High touch areas include doorknobs and crash bars, light switches and lunch tables, handrails, as well as drinking fountains. Staff and student restrooms will be cleaned daily by our night custodial crews per CDC guidelines. These guidelines ensure that we both clean and sanitize every surface in the restroom at least once a day. Restrooms will also be cleaned and spot checked for stock and for cleanliness throughout the day by our daytime custodians. COVID related signage has been installed on each campus to remind people of proper hygiene practices as well as safety measures that have been put in place such as wearing of masks and social distancing. Paths of travel have been identified at each campus to maximize social distancing. Each path of travel has been clearly marked. Hand sanitizer has been procured and placed in strategic locations throughout all of our district campuses in the forms of hand sanitizer stations like this one, or we also have hand sanitizer dispensers in every classroom available for use. At RUSD, we understand that a healthy indoor environment is critical to a good learning environment. This starts with having all of our HVAC systems start up at least 30 minutes prior to any occupants entering the room. This ensures that the entire space is well ventilated. All HVAC units in our USD are regularly serviced. This ensures proper operation and optimum ventilation. This service includes a thorough cleaning of both the condensing and evaporation coils in order to remove any contaminants that may come in contact with the air supplied to the room. This, as well, increases efficiency. Fresh air intake has been maximized on all units in order to ensure that fresh filtered air is continually being introduced into our classrooms. Filters have been upgraded to the highest efficiency possible and are changed out every three months. 
Our cafeteria staff has been engaged in training covering federal, state, and local health regulations and procedures. All of our meals are pre-packaged for safety. Meal service for virtual and distance learning students will include drive-through and curbside pickup options. Students returning to on-campus instruction will be provided meals on-site. Staff preparation stations have been reorganized to meet social distancing requirements. Meal service areas have been updated with floor markers, signage, and have been reorganized to encourage physical distancing through increased spacing, small groups, and limited mixing between groups when possible. School sites have staggered meal times to allow for cleaning between meal services and to serve students in smaller groups. For protection of our students and staff, we have implemented a new touchless point of sale system to assist us with maintaining social distancing and touchless service. The team at Central Kitchen has been delivering disposable aprons, masks, face shields, and gloves to all schools. Thank you for entrusting us to feed your children. I'm Jay Burns, Location Manager with First Student at Riverside. Here at First Student, we're dedicated to the safety of all our USD students and the Riverside community as a whole. We have a regimented disinfection program for the bus interior with a heightened focus on high-touch area wipe-down, adhering to all CDC guidelines. To maximize social distancing, we will only have one bus in the loading and unloading zone at a time. When the bus arrives, it will come to a stop no closer than 12 feet from the nearest student. All bus riders will be required to wear face coverings during their entire bus journey. Loading the bus from back to front in a zigzag pattern clearly outlined with easy to read signage throughout the bus. And subsequently, unloading front to back will minimize any cross paths travel and close contact by students. Bus windows will also be down as much as possible to increase circulation within the bus. Here at First Student, we are dedicated to our partnership with RUSD. I know we have all made every effort to keep our community safe. Ms. Brown deserves to be the Teacher of the Year because of the positive impact that she has um, on our students and our staff and everyone across the board. If there's one thing Kisa has that stands out above all the many other qualities that we know a good teacher should have or must have are her bonds and relationships that she forms with her students when they walk on campus. She builds on a strong rapport with learners as she teaches a rigorous academics and builds on positive character traits. Students who leave University Heights Middle School go on to high school and go on to college. They always come back to uni and they come and see Miss Brown. Every year we have a number of students who come through the front office because they need to talk to Miss Brown about where they're going to college or they need to talk to her about what they accomplished when they're in college. She's been a huge part of so many students' journeys, um, influencing them in the most positive manner possible. Growing up with older siblings, I already knew so many of the teachers that they liked, they didn't like, and one of them in particular was Miss Brown. And she was such a big impact on everybody, and I really wanted her, so I joined Abbott, which was her profession. And she, I finally got to have her eighth grade, and it was such an amazing experience. Miss Brown has done a lot for me. She's given me great opportunities, and has, has given me more confidence. She's taught me to keep my goals in check, to stay focused, and that right now, you have to look at the bigger picture. Miss Brown has shown me the importance of college and how it will affect the rest of my life. She has taught me that these years of my life are very important to where I will end up in life and what kind of college I will be accepted to. Miss Brown has uh, taught both my children the importance of note taking and organizational skills to prepare them for college. Ms. Brown also helped refine my leadership skills and helped me grow as a person. She is kind, she is caring, she helps students who are struggling academically, and she encourages students to invest in themselves and their future by cultivating a work ethic and pride necessary to be successful. She taught me how to be more organized and how to deal with life 
beyond high school. She has taught me how to keep going for my goals and never to give up. Ms. Brown always taught me to finish my assignments, helped me with all my grades, made sure everything was done. She's really helped me um, keep up my grades. She builds excellent relationships with parents. She's an outstanding educator, both on our campus and throughout the district. 13 years, we've seen uh, a lot of kids go through her, her school, through her classes, and they've been awesome. She's helped them in many ways. Over the past 14 years, Ms. Brown has taught three of my children, two which have graduated from college now. Mrs. Brown has been a great mentor to all four of my children. Mrs. Brown is more than a teacher. She's part of our family. Ms. Brown has not only been a teacher from my past, but a mentor and a role model. She has guided me through school and life. She has been there for me through a numerous amount of events, and I can only be grateful for her staying in my life. The kids would bring stuff home with, with them to help us to become better parents. And uh, Ms. Brown has always been awesome. You can't take that away from her. When I think of Kisa, I think of the words again of Rita Pearson when she said, every kid deserves a champion, an adult who will never give up on them, and one who understands the power of connection and insists they become the best they can possibly be. She's always trying to make her students better people, which is what she's done for me. She likes to make sure someone's okay and she knows her students very well. She gets to know her students, so when something's wrong, she knows what's up. When I first started, it was readily apparent that all of the staff and students on campus um, felt like she was a positive leader. She had excellent relationships. Kisa is being an individual that is always willing to give support and words of encouragement to uplift myself and others. She's a very positive person. Whenever a kid is sad in our class, she, you know, she's always joking around to try and, you know, help us. She has always been there for them, giving them extra help when they need it, um, lifting their spirits. She's always there to, you know, keep you up whenever you're down. She cares about uh, a lot of other people, and she goes out of her way to be a better person and to make other people better people. You can see the value of the relationships that she has nurtured as a teacher in the faces and reflects in the faces of those students who come back and visit her. Ms. Brown deserves this award because she's a very caring and determined teacher and she cares about the well-being of the students. Ms. Brown deserves this award because she has done so much for students and helped them in so many ways. Kisa Brown's commitment to her students and her relationships that she builds even outside of the classroom are deserving of that. I want to say thank you, Ms. Brown, for all you've done for my children and for all the children of University Heights Middle School. I would thank her for getting me in check in eighth grade so I can grow and be a better person in the future. Congratulations, Kisa. Job well done. Congratulations, Kisa. Congratulations, Ms. Brown. Congratulations, Ms. Brown. Congratulations, Ms. Brown. Congratulations, Ms. Brown, for being named RUSD's Middle School Teacher of the Year. From the Molina family to Ms. Brown. Congratulations, we love you. There's no one I think is more deserving. We always stay in touch, and it's been such an amazing thing to keep such a great teacher, a great mentor around because we all need one like her. Hi students! Hello RUSD students! Hola a todos! We have missed you so much. We are excited with the possibility of reopening our schools to in-person instruction. Estamos muy contentos con la posibilidad de abrir nuestras escuelas para instrucción en persona. We're so happy to have you back and we cannot wait to see you. Here at Riverside Unified School District. Lo hemos extrañado y esperamos darle la bienvenido pronto. In this video, you're going to see some very important things that you need to know before you return to campus. Please pay close attention to these helpful safety tips. Por favor de poner atención a estas sugerencias de seguridad para el bienestar de todos. 
Coming to school is going to look a little different. What we mean is that you and your parents need to have your mask on when you come to our campuses. Depending on your grade level, you are going to have different drop-offs and pick-up areas. Your times will be staggered as well throughout each one of those gates. Please take a look at the schedules provided by your individual schools. When you arrive here in the morning, we'll have the noon supervisors here ready to help you out of your cars. And they're going to direct you to some spaces for you to stand and wait until we're ready to take your temperature. For all our bus riders, our bus drivers are so excited to have you back. We want to show you exactly what to expect when we reopen our schools for in-person. As you'll see, only one bus will arrive in the loading zone at a time. All students and the driver will be required to wear face coverings during the entire ride. To make sure students are spread out, they will be loaded onto the bus from the back to the front, and we will unload from the front to the back. You will also notice that all the windows will be open as much as possible. Kinder and preschool have new drop-off procedures. We'll be meeting you at the gate. A staff member will be taking the student's temperature. We'll be handing you some sanitizer for your hands, and a staff member will be walking you directly to our classroom. Entering our campus, you're going to see a fancy little machine standing there to welcome you. What that is, is a thermo scanner. It takes your temperature quick and easy so you can get right to class. Every campus will have their own path of travel. Be sure to follow the signs and floor markers to ensure proper social distancing. We want to assure all of our families that in our classrooms, all students are going to be maintaining six feet of distance. As you can see, our classrooms look a little different. You'll see that our desks are spaced apart and there are protective shields on them. Also, our teachers have a protective shield with them. That way we can keep everyone safe and socially distanced. I would like to tell my students that are in the dual language immersion program that things are going to be just a little different this year. Instead of having two teachers, one for Spanish and one for English, you're going to have one teacher that is doing both Spanish and English. Uh, quiero decir a las familias de nuestro programa de doble immersion que va a ser un cambio este año en que en vez de tener dos maestros, uno para inglés y uno para español, van a tener la misma maestra para inglés y español. Hey kiddos, as you get prepared for your smart start to come back on campus, remember we're not sharing supplies. So if something happens and you need a sharpened pencil and you don't have an extra, just raise your hand and your teacher will make sure you get one. We've prepared for everyone to come back to school and be safe and healthy. From our special needs students to our preschoolers all the way up to our sixth graders, we have plans in place to keep all of our students safe. Washing your hands for 20 seconds is another way we can keep safe and healthy at school. One way to do that is you can say your ABCs from beginning to end. All of the staff here at school have exactly what you need to be safe throughout your day. So if you break your mask, just look for an adult and they'll be able to help you get a replacement. Lunches are gonna look different depending on what school you're at. You might be eating inside, you might be eating outside, but you're gonna be at six feet of distance, still spending time with your friends and being safe. We have different facilities and that's okay. Look at what we're doing here. We're gonna use our awesome quad and we're going to do lunch on the quad every day that it's not a rainy day. But guess what? We know when it's time to eat, you can't eat through your mask and we don't expect you to lift it through every bite. So your teachers are gonna teach you the proper way to take those off and then you're gonna put them right next to you so that as soon as you're done eating and you've wiped your face, you can go ahead and put your mask back on. Grab and go meals will be available on and off campus. Please make sure to check the schedule. We know how much you enjoy playing at recess time with basketballs and tether balls and swings, and we're not gonna be able to do that right now. We will have some fun games for you to do, like Simon Says and dancing and other activities. We really want to thank our families for all the support you have offered during this time of distance learning. Queremos agradecer a nuestras familias por todo su apoyo durante este, este tiempo de aprendizaje de distancia. Parents, we want you to know that we have missed you too, and we value the support that you bring to our campus. However, during this time, to make sure that we do have that safe start, we are still not having volunteers on campus. So no campus visitations, but not to worry. If you need anything, just give us a call. When students are exiting campus, they will be dismissed in small groups of students by class to ensure that students are socially distanced and safe as they exit campus. 
When you are picking up your students, we please ask of you to stay in the designated areas so we can maintain safe distance and we will make sure that your students safely arrive to where you are. Cuando los estamos pidiendo, por favor, que cuando están esperando a sus hijos que se queden en el área designada para que podamos mantener la seguridad de sus hijos y vamos a asegurar que lleguen a, con ustedes con seguridad. Many schools have before and after school programs. All those programs will continue. However, they will remain virtual for the remaining of phase two and phase three. We recognize that our special day class students have unique learning needs in regards to the way they access curriculum and instruction and the needs they have for socialization. We hope that modifications to their schedule will meet the needs of all of our families in the RUSD community. For additional details, please visit our webpage at riversideunified.org. We want to thank everyone for watching and making sure that we have a safe, smart start. Until we're back together again, stay safe and healthy, and we can't wait to see you back at school soon. We can't wait to have you guys on campus. We are looking forward to seeing all your faces. Hasta que podemos ver a todos ustedes otra vez, que se queden seguros y saludables. Remember, wash your hands and wear your mask, and we will keep you safe. RUSD Families, Nutrition Services invites you to apply for the 2020-2021 meal program. All families are encouraged to apply beginning July 1st, 2020. If your student qualified for the meal program last school year, your household will need to reapply. If you did not qualify last school year and circumstances have changed, we encourage you to apply before the new school year resumes. If you qualify for the meal program, you may also qualify for programs such as utility assistance, SAT fee waivers, and college application fee waivers. For more information, visit riversideunified.org and don't forget to reapply or apply beginning July 1st, 2020. Tonight I will be playing Edna Turnblad in the musical Hairspray for the RUSD Honors Musical. When I heard about Hairspray auditions, I found out when it was right away. My teacher made an announcement that Hairspray had auditioned and I really wanted to be a part of it. It's a really good musical and it talks about change in a different era coming up and I really think that's cool for younger people and older people to watch. The Honors Musical pulls students from all across our district, from all of our high schools. They're coming here to perform live at the Fox in this very amazing professional historic venue. I play Tracy in Hairspray. I play Seaweed J. Stubbs. He's like a cool cat. I'm playing a Mission Street kid, and her name is Lorraine. I play the flute. I'm doing sound. I am the uh, percussionist. I am Shelly, the nicest kid in town. I am a sound technician. What I do is costumes. I do costumes. I play keyboard in the pit. I'm house right spot. We have students on all aspects of production. They are on stage. They are backstage working with Live Nation stage crew. They are down in the pit working with professional musicians. Playing alongside these professionals and having the chance to talk to them and get a little bit of input from them has been really beneficial in regards to showing them what a career would look like. I have experience doing tech, but this is just way different because this is like an actual theater. It's not a school theater. I'm actually pursuing directing instead of acting as a career. And this production has really showed me like the more intricate parts of putting on a, a stage show. It's an amazing opportunity to work with all the schools and all the kids and to have master workshops with people that already starred on Broadway that could help us with dancing and singing and acting. And it's, it's a great way to open the door. I'm Michelle Grotness and I'm the director of Hairspray. The students that we find in the Honors Musical come from all of the high schools around the Riverside Unified School District. Students will uh, meet with us two to three times a week for about four months and here we are and we're ready to go. 
It's a really music heavy show, so I've taught all of the vocal music to the cast, all of the leads, all of the ensemble. We're excited to have students from every high school this year. It's very important that we host these district-wide opportunities for kids. One of the things that we don't do enough of is involve kids from many different genres of art across the district cooperating together and having fun. And this is one way we can do that. It was awesome to have that experience with the kids from all the different schools. Getting together, it's really amazing. It's like a family, to me it is. Working with, uh, with different people from other schools is like really cool, like it creates basically like a family. You gotta meet these new students that have more experience than you, less experience. You gotta help them out and they help you out. It's the best. We're hearing that some of the students in past years are now going to each other's shows at their other schools, they're keeping in touch. Um, so this really intensive experience is something that, that perhaps is launching a lifetime of, of a network for these students. This is my first time doing this. I've been a tech at my school for a few years and I figured I might need a change and I might want to try something in a facility that's more different than the one I'm more used to. It's so fun. It's like a new experience because this theater is completely different from like high school theaters. It's great. We have room to move <laughs> for one. It's just much more professional and it feels more like real. It's the Fox Theater. I mean, there's more of everything. We have to work with the cast, all the tech, all the sound, and the music is totally different. The music pit for the Hairspray Orchestra consists of a mixture of professionals that we brought in from the surrounding communities, as well as a mix of high school students. We wound up with an exciting group of 16 students this year on saxophones, on trumpets, on percussion, drum set, everything in between, keyboards, and it's a fun, exciting mix of students overall. It's been an honor to play with professionals, and they've taught me a lot. I've never played with professionals. This is my first year doing this, and I tend to do it all next year and the year after that. This is our third time ever producing this event. I started three years ago with Such Sweet Sorrow, and last year is the chorus line, and here I am for the third time around. This is my second year, and I hope to do it for two more years. This is my second year doing the Honors Musical. First year I was an actor, second I'm tech. This is my first time doing the Honors Musical. This is my second time doing the Honors Musical. This is my third and final RUSD Honors Musical. I've been here since the beginning. And this is my last one and I'm really excited to be a part of it. This is all to put together a show for what we're anticipating to be over 3,000 people. We have 1,500 middle and high school students coming to see the production for the matinee. And then in the evening we'll have a community show for another sold out house. We're working very closely with Live Nation, which is a nationwide theater management company that really helps to foster our students in the technical components. Uh, we're partnering with the Riverside Fox Foundation, who has helped to support some of our programs. We're working with colleges and universities who are coming to see some of our best students in action and talk to them about future opportunities as they move forward and pursue the arts as a career or even in college. The practice you'll get is what's going to make you good. I would recommend doing the show, both as an actor and as a tech. You get to meet new people, new directors, and stuff like that. And cool. students as well. Please, come on in. It's one of the funnest things I've done, for theater especially. You should really go through with it, because it's amazing getting an opportunity to do it at this theater. The minute the curtain opens, you hear the people clapping, you just automatically get this chill, you get teary-eyed. It's it's a great experience, it's a great feeling. It is totally worth it. I will definitely want to do it again. It's really fun. <laughs>
y escribir en los dos idiomas también. My children's first language is English. Um, they actually learned Spanish in the DLI program, and then I just supported everything at home once they were involved in the program. And mommy was in Spanish class. Did you help mommy? Sí, pues mi mamá preguntó que que ellos están en español clase y ellos y ella necesita ayudar con un examen y ellos ayudó y ella se quedó y ella se quedó siempre siento. They have the same curriculum as the other students do. In the primary grades, it's heavy in the Spanish, and they get English language development in English. In the upper grades, they have a 50-50 model, half of the day in Spanish and the other half in English. What do you like to learn in school? Me gusta aprend aprender matemáticas. ¿Qué te gusta aprender en la escuela? M my favorite subject of school is writing because I can learn Things that are bilingual. Los padres pueden solicitar una aplicación para el programa de inmersión de lenguaje dual tan pronto como en Jardín de Niños o hasta primer grado. At Fremont Elementary School, our DLI program is expanding. It's currently in kindergarten, first, and second grade, and next year it will move on to third. Longfellow is proud to offer dual language immersion. We're also a STEM school. We emphasize hands-on STEM activities for a portion of the day. We begin in kindergarten, which means that our students can apply the year before, which would be a preschool or transitional kindergarten age, to enter our school to begin in kindergarten. Jefferson Elementary School offers a dual language immersion program, kindergarten through fifth grade, and next year we will add sixth grade. They participate in all regular school activities, field trips, special events, assemblies, just like everyone else. Spanish is interwoven into everything that we do here at Mountain View. Our assemblies are in both languages. Our morning announcements are in both languages. Our students are speaking in both languages. ¿Cuántos años tienen? I have, I am seven years old. ¿Cuántos años tienes? Yo tengo siete años. How old are you? I am seven years old. And where do you use what you've learned? Um, mi mamá preguntó dónde yo están um, hablando español. Están ayudando a mi abuela y mi abuelo se habló en español. ¿Qué te gusta aprender en la escuela? I like learning English because I like science. Solicite la aplicación en riversideunified.org. ¿Usted le quiere decir algo a sus maestros? I would like to say that thanks for teaching me how to be bilingual. Would you like to thank your teacher? Sí. Gracias por enseñarme. Gracias por enseñarme español. ¿Qué quieres decir a tu maestra? I want to say, Mr. Rana and Sierra, thank you to teaching me in English and Spanish. Is there anyone you'd like to thank? La pregunta era si hay alguien que quiere decir gracias. Yo quiero decir gracias a todas mis maestras de DLA. Yo quiero decir gracias a mis papás por ponerme en el programa de DLA. Is there anything you want to tell your teacher? Gracias por enseñarme. Gracias por enseñarme español. ¿Qué quieres decirle a tu maestra? I would, uh, I would like to say to my teacher that thank you for teaching me in third grade. Yo quiero decir a mi maestra, yo, gracias por haciendo español a yo. And I want to say thank you to my mom for taking me to a Spanish class so I can learn more Spanish. Yo quiero decir gracias a mi mamá porque traje a, a ella español clase y ayudar a, a, a que yo se pueda ayudar a ella. That's it. Yay! Yeah. Good job, baby girl. Now, take me to the class. Hi, I'm Crystal Hart from the Department of Innovation and Learner Engagement, and today we're going to look at some free online tutoring opportunities for students 5th through 12th grade. Do you ever feel like you get stuck at home and you don't know who to ask? Wish you had someone to help you? RUSD now offers Paper, a free online tutoring service for all 5th through 12th grade students. Paper gives you access to live tutors via chat 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. You have unlimited sessions 
and their tutors can help you with any academic subject. First, you'll need to log in to your Clever portal and then click on the paper tutoring icon. Paper is super easy to use. You will open up to a dashboard, click on the content area you would like help with, or you can type in your question. Paper even has an essay review feature. Once you're connected with a tutor, a live person will start a chat with you. The first time that you use Paper, you will need to sign a code of conduct. Your code of conduct includes classroom etiquette, essay review guidelines, internet safety, and academic integrity. After you cite the code of conduct, you will begin a chat with your tutor. Tutors do not give answers, but they will help guide you to the correct answer. You will be able to use a whiteboard to show your work and have a conversation with the tutor. Once you've solved your first question, they are there to help you if you need help with another question. If you'd like more information about Paper, the free online tutoring resource, visit bit.ly forward slash RUSD FAM 20. That's bit.ly forward slash RUSD FAM 20 for more details and more videos to help you. Welcome to University Heights Middle School. I'm Katie Grimble, I'm the principal here at uni. Today I'm gonna to share five things I love about our school. First is the variety of clubs and activities that we have. While we have traditional sports like soccer, volleyball, basketball, we also have a variety of things that are unique to us. Things like Sister STEM Interest Program, Club 3.0, Girl Talk, Mariachi, Ballet Folklorico, Robotics, Makerspace, 3D Printing, wood shop and coding as well. The next thing I love about our school is that we're a personalized learning school. What that means is that each student has a learner profile where they identify their strengths and the ways that they learn best as a student. The teachers then use this to help them develop personalized learning plans, which are used to tailor instruction and activities to the needs of each student as an individual. Next up is our family resource room. We have a dedicated space for parent trainings, activities to come in and utilize computers, printers, or just assistance for parents needing to apply for programs or access community resources. One of the things unique to our family resource room is that we have a food pantry and community closet available for families in need as well. Another thing I love about uni is our AVID school-wide program. We have a school-wide focus on college and career readiness, including high academic expectations in all core classes. Students are reading and writing no matter the subject area. And finally, we have a comprehensive social emotional learning program, including restorative practices along with social skills instruction in all classes to make sure that our students are successful not only academically, but also socially. School culture is really important to me. So if the teachers are happy, the students are happy. If the students are happy, they have positive relationships with people on campus, then they're more likely to learn and put forth the effort that we need for them to be successful academically. At University Heights, we believe that all decisions should put students first. We prioritize culture and community in all of our decision making. What that means to us is that anytime we are making decisions, deciding between two options, prioritizing programs, spending money, those are the things that we use to decide what we're going to do. So as a staff, we come together and say which one of these furthers our core values, and that's how we decide what we're going to do next. The goal of our school is to provide each student with challenging and rigorous curriculum appropriate to their academic level. We believe every child can achieve academic success. With parents and teachers working together toward the same goal, every child will succeed. Through teamwork, open communication, and a dedication to continuous improvement, we can make this school a place where students delight and enjoy learning. Riverside Unified partners with over 20 local farmers they deliver fresh produce to our central kitchen, and we deliver it to all of our sites daily. Here at the central kitchen, we get a nice variety of produce that we get in. We have multiple farmers that we use within Riverside. 
We use not just oranges, but whatever fruits or produce that is available during season. So we also get lettuce, grapes, fresh strawberries from farmers that are local, melons, peaches, nectarines. I work for our USD as the food hub coordinator. I work with local farmers and helping them decide what to grow for the district and what varieties of produce and when we need it. We introduced the farm to school program in 2005 to try to teach our students lifelong healthy eating habits. It is easy and quick to apply online by visiting riversideunified.org and apply online through the meal program application. Today I wanted to talk to you a little bit about my journey into science. Imagine a scientist. What does a scientist look like to you? A lab coat, yes. Glassware, mixing chemicals in a lab, yes. And the big glasses, sometimes sort of falling or taped. But how many of you guys maybe thought of something different? Like a field biologist like Jane Goodall? or the two astronauts who just did the first ever female spacewalk, Christina Cook and Jessica Muir. But how many of you guys actually pictured yourselves? Not everyone usually does, and this is something that educators often are trying to sort out, is why, why don't we picture ourselves in this role? Why don't we ever see ourselves as a scientist? When you ask a male or a female your interest in STEM after graduation, half of the guys are gonna say, yeah, STEM is something I'm really interested in, but a fraction of women are actually joining in that same interest. And this sort of then trickles down into the actual workforce. When I actually graduated high school, I was one of those statistics. I did not identify as a scientist. I had no interest in science. I just didn't know what to do with the science degree. Inspire Her Mind is a conference that gets girls thinking about actually careers in science. They get to see some of the cool applications of science. They get to see women working in these areas. We know there's not as many women in the STEM workforce as there are men. So we're really trying to be proactive and be able to get girls involved and really show them that this is an opportunity for them. I did not expect this. I'm gonna be honest, I first came here because I wanted to get extra credit and then it turned out to be more than that. I wasn't really expecting all of these like different interactive activities that we got to do. The one where you have to like inspect the cells of the plants and everything. We saw like stomata and how it's on the back of the leaf and we just learned more of like what we're learning in biology so it's cool to see it just like not in the classroom. We learned from like people who were specialized in their field so they were like really passionate about it and then so we got to learn just like straight from them and it was really fun. I don't really like science that much but my friend convinced me and it's nothing like what I expected. It's way funner. It's like a broad spectrum of different things that you can do. In one of the activities, we kind of learned about how different types of lines can make dresses appear differently. We had to draw like lines on the dresses to make appearances either look longer or shorter or thinner or thicker. When I went to college, you have to take classes that are beyond your major, right? And so I took one that was global environmental problems. And in that class, I was just blown away and I realized this is where I want to make a difference. I now have a lab that gets to look at these environmental issues and I absolutely love my job. It took a long time to figure out that this is what I wanted, but I am so happy where I'm at. I really liked it because it was more focused on us because we were able to individually analyze what we wanted, not what anybody else wanted us to learn. We took a personality quiz and that quiz was honestly like my favorite part. We were able to find out like the specific um, topics that we were interested in. Mine was advisor because I want to be in the medical field, I want to be an RN. I got a maker and I thought that was really cool because ever since I was little I would always love working with my hands and I still do. This is a really great opportunity for girls to get that hands-on experience and to open their eyes. I decided to come on a whim. I thought we were just going to get like hour-long lectures or and everything but Instead, we got to have like these fun experiences. I expected to see men in lab coats. I also expected people to just tell about their jobs and then how we could help our city, but instead I learned about how those small careers add up to um, help the, the whole world. 
We're really focusing on getting girls excited and engaged in STEM fields and potential STEM careers. My expectations when we came here was that we would go into a lecture hall, they would lecture us, and then we would leave. I didn't expect it to be as hands-on and as innovative and interactive as it was, and I think that that's the reason why I enjoyed it as much as I did. It's part of their everyday lives, and helping them understand that and appreciate that is, is also part of this endeavor. My favorite thing was seeing the batteries and the wire thing move around. Oh, I saw that amazing little robot. Did you guys? Yeah. yeah. The way they were coded had them follow a pathway, and in that pathway were certain color codes, and those color codes would dictate what the robot did. It was so little, and it was so cute, and <laughs> the fact that I could literally just drop like a bunch of colors, and it would make the robot do different things. It was really, really like impressive, and I really like that. I'm a wild life biologist by training. I get to work with animals, habitats, and the environment. We learned about the California condor, and we found causes of death among condors and why they almost went extinct. And how due to like conservation by people that are in the STEM field, they were able to multiply, and now they're a growing species again. The program provides an opportunity for our students, young ladies, to look into STEM as a possibility and also leadership. There is definitely a gap out in the workforce, so what are we doing? We're bringing our girls in and we're helping build the confidence around those two specific areas. I'm actually really looking forward to coming back and seeing what other activities they have for us. I heard them say that leadership was going to be the focus of the second conference. I'm definitely really interested in that and I think it's really important for women to realize that leadership is an important skill to have. It's definitely something that's really related to STEM because STEM is leading the field in so many industries nowadays. I'm also looking forward to coming back and learning more about the small careers that can build up to help everybody around. I think it's really important to expose them to the vast array of careers and how a scientific background can help you succeed at anything you choose to do. We have very special things to be distributed to all of our students today. In your sixth period, we will be distributing LA Clippers backpacks courtesy of Kawhi Leonard and the LA Clippers. There are backpacks for every student. Happy holidays from the Clippers and Kawhi Leonard. Martin Luther King High School is very, very appreciative of the Clippers organization and for Kawhi Leonard himself for providing the backpacks for all of our students, not only here at campus, but also throughout the district, considering the fact that he did play for us for a couple years. And it's a great gesture and it very much shows his quality of character and commitment to our area. really like to thank Mr. Leonard. He's done an incredibly generous thing and helped the holidays of all of our RUSD students by giving them backpacks. It's an incredibly kind and thoughtful gesture on his part and we are so grateful. for just, you know, bringing up your community that you grew up in, handing everybody out the backpacks, because, you know, some people, some people really can't afford to get backpacks and such. I know that from experience, and like having a free backpack definitely means a lot. Thank you. We just wanted to say thank you so much to Kawhi. These backpacks are awesome. We love them. Hey man, thanks for the free backpacks. Thank, thank you, you Kawhi. Thank you, Kawhi. I'm glad you went to our school. It makes me really happy to you know you walk the same hallways. Thank you, Kawhi. Bro, we got the new heat, bro. I would like to express my deepest gratitude to the Los Angeles Clippers Foundation and two-time NBA world champion Kawhi Leonard. We are especially proud of Mr. Kawhi Leonard for being a graduate of King High School at Riverside Unified School District. He is an inspiration to students throughout the world. 
and we know that his contributions and his character of what he does to help communities off the court is what makes him truly an inspiration for all of us. So thank you again, Kawhi Leonard and the Los Angeles Clippers Foundation. students is to provide them with a nutritious meal, authentic foods that they will enjoy all year long. I'm hoping all the effort that we put into our meals are enjoyed by the students. Can I get the orange chicken? Chicken sandwich. Karaoke, right? Chicken chow mein. Can I get some nachos? Nachos. I'm gonna get everything on them. Cheeseburger, chicken sandwich, spicy chicken sandwich, pizza. Bean and cheese burrito. I had tacos today with um, beans. We get fresh produce delivered twice a week that we use on our salads and our tacos. We have a vegetarian wrap with no meat. We serve tortas and burritos, chicken chili verde. We have our barbecue served every day with hamburgers, hot dogs, and crispy chicken sandwiches. You can apply for the meal program online by visiting riversideunified.org. So apply as soon as possible. My name is Matt Cash and I have the privilege of serving our community as the principal at Fremont Elementary School. Here are five things that I absolutely love about Fremont. The first thing I love is our dual language immersion program, or DLI for short. All of Fremont's DLI teachers have a bilingual credential. In our DLI classrooms, students are taught in both English and in Spanish. And by the end of their sixth grade year, our students have the opportunity to grow into students that are biliterate bilingual, and bicultural. Next, Fremont is a no excuses university school, or NEU for short. That means that we adhere to the belief that every single child deserves the opportunity to be educated in a way that prepares them for college and career. Fremont is also an avid elementary school. That means that our teachers and staff are trained in the most up-to-date techniques to keep our students engaged in content and in the classroom. NEU and AVID go hand in hand. NEU provides us the systems we need to prepare our kids for college and career, and AVID provides us the strategies, real time, on the ground, that we use inside the classroom to accomplish that. If you ever have the opportunity to walk around Fremont Elementary School, you will see a college presence here on campus. We have banners, pennants, and flags from a variety of colleges around the country hanging in our hallways and in our library. That means that from day one of a student attending our school, we instill the belief that if they want to, they can go to college and pursue the career that they were made for. Fremont Elementary has an amazing show choir. Our show choir is so dynamic that they've been invited to perform at places like the Festival of Lights, at City Hall for the Mayor and City Council, and even here in our community for local holiday shows. If you ever have a chance to catch one of their shows, you should. Here at Fremont, we are all about partnerships. That includes partnerships with local universities like UCR, the University of California, Riverside. They have a program for volunteers called AmeriCorps, where they come onto campus and college students tutor our elementary students in math, language arts, and other subject areas. Each of these college students work with individuals each day to ensure that our students not only know that they can do their best, but they're also given a mentor that they can aspire to be. Lastly, we pride ourselves on meaningful interventions. That means that data management is a high priority. We know who our kids are, we know their strengths and their challenges, and we design instruction that meets those needs and takes them from where they are to where they need to be in order to be successful. One of our core values is student engagement. We create opportunities for our students to meet their current needs and challenge them to become their best. Fremont Elementary School is unique. Opened in 1917, Fremont is one of the most storied elementary schools here in our city. Our school has been in the La Placida community for more than 100 years. That means we serve generation after generation of learners who have come through our doors. 
Fremont provides art classes, community service projects, band, show choir, social and emotional services, parent training, community activities, after school enrichment, and so much more. We're excited for the programs we bring to the La Placida community, and we're happy to serve our families. So with that we say, welcome to Fremont. Oh, okay. Hi. <laughs> Hello. Welcome back to the RUSD board meeting for February 18th. I'm Tom Hunt, your, the board president. On behalf of my colleagues, uh, trustees Lee, Alavi, Farouk, and Kinnear, I welcome you. And uh, I've got a few announcements. Uh, please follow the link provided in the agenda if you, uh, for Spanish live stream, and that's at www.riversideunified.org. Uh, www.riversideunified, one word, .org. We are broadcasting today in uh, closed captions, so those watching the meeting live stream can follow the live transcription on the closed captioning through a link in YouTube. In accordance with the orders from the governor of California, uh, Dr. Kaiser, the health officer of the county of Riverside, and guidelines from the disease of uh, center, excuse me, of disease control related to maintaining public health and safety in this unprecedented time, our meeting will be held online. There is no physical meeting location open to the public. We do look forward to the day when that changes. The Board of Education encourages members of the public to join the meeting electronically and in, in public comment uh, to an item or overall to lend your voice, your insights and concern because these are important and valued by the Board of Education and our staff. Members of the public can find information on our board meeting agenda uh, online regarding how to submit your public comments. Now, on behalf of the, of the board and our district, I am pleased to acknowledge the Lunar New Year, which started on February 12th of this year. Lunar New Year, Chinese New Year, is commonly associated with the Chinese New Year or Spring Festival and is celebrated by many Asian cultures. It's a time for families and new beginnings. And uh, I wanna say that particularly here in Riverside, which we have a great, uh, a history of, of diversity and culture. We're, we're the home of the Arata House that, that historically got rid of red, red lining and many others. So I, I'm very proud to announce this on behalf of the board. So happy new, lunar, lunar New Year to all. We wish you and your families good health, prosperities, and for all of us, a brighter 2021. Now I'd like to introduce our Assistant Superintendent for Operations, Mr. Sergio San Martin to provide this message in Spanish. Thank you, Mr. Martin. Thank you, President Hunt. Muy buenas tardes, bienvenidos a la reunión de la Junta de Educación del 18 de febrero del 2021. Si gustan ver esta reunión en español, sigan el enlace incluido dentro del orden del día, el cual puede encontrar en nuestro sitio de línea en www.riversideunified.org. Hoy también estamos transmitiendo con subtítulos para quienes están viendo la transmisión en vivo. Pueden seguir los subtítulos en vivo por medio del enlace en YouTube. La Junta respetará las recientes órdenes del gobernador de California, el oficial de salud del condado de Riverside y las órdenes de los centros de control de enfermedades. Esto es en relación con el mantenimiento de la salud y la, la seguridad pública. 
Esta reunión se llevará a cabo solo en transmisión en línea y no habrá un lugar físico de reunión abierto al público. Le recomendamos a los miembros del público que se una a la reunión electrónicamente. Su voz y su perspectiva son importantes. <coughs> Los miembros del público pueden encontrar la información para cómo presentar sus comentarios públicos en el orden del día de la Junta de Educación. También me gustaría reconocer el Año Nuevo Lunar, el cual inició el 12 de febrero. El Año Nuevo Lunar generalmente se asocia con el Año Nuevo Chino o el Festival de la Primavera y se celebra en muchas culturas asiáticas. Es tiempo para la familia y nuevos comienzos. Así que, feliz Nuevo Año Lunar para todos y les deseamos buena salud y mucho éxito en el 2021. Muchas gracias. Back to you, Mr. Hunt. Thank you, Assistant Superintendent San Martin. That's really great. So uh, the, the meeting started at 430 and then the board adjourned into closed session and I will report that there is no reportable action was taken during the closed session meeting. And now for the Pledge of Allegiance. This evening will be led by some very special young guests whom I will ask Trustee Brent Lee to introduce. Trustee Lee. Thank you, Mr. Hunt. I do, I have three guests with me today that'll lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance and I'll let them introduce themselves. Hello, I am Henry Lee. I am in the fourth grade and we all go to Washington Elementary School. Hello, my name is Felix. I am in third grade and I'm in Miss Salazar's class. Hi, my name is Amelia B, and I go and I go to and I and I go to first grade, and my teacher is Miss Capisano. Please stand for the pledge of allegiance. Place your right hand over your heart. Begin. Yo prometo lealtad a la bandera de los Estados Unidos de América y a la República que representa una nación bajo Dios, indivisible, con libertad y justicia para todos. Ah. Thank you so much, you lead children. If anybody ever needs to get there, their phone fixed uh, to see Henry Lee, one of the brightest young people you'll ever meet. Wonderful children and all RUSD uh, students as you heard. Thank you very much, Felix, Henry, and Amelia B. Uh, and uh, so uh, right now we're going to open the, oh, right now, I'm sorry. I need to ask the board if you allow me through a motion to move uh, item E after, move up item F after item E. And I get a motion for that too. Thank you, Mrs. Alavi. Do I have a second? Second. All right, I'll take a quick roll call. Mrs. Alavi? Yes. Thank you, ma'am. Dr. Farouk? Yes. Uh, Dr. I mean, excuse me, uh, Trustee Lee? Yes. Trustee Kinnear? Yes. Uh, Trustee, uh, board member, student board member of Mystery, how are you doing? Good to good, see you. Good, how are you? Thank you, good. Yes. <laughs> okay, thank you. And, and the president votes yes. So thank you, we will do that. And that will move public. Uh, input after the uh, superintendent's report. So uh, at this time, though, I'm going to ask Ms. Frosto just to announce, and so people can get ready for that, to uh, uh, any items, uh, if you want to talk about how to open the queue and all, so public comment can, can be held, Ms. Frosto. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you. We will now open the queue to provide public comment for agenda item E. If you are a member of the public who has joined the Zoom call today to comment on agenda item E, public input for all items that are not listed on the agenda, you may now enter the queue until the item begins by using the raised hand function if you are logged in using the computer or star nine if you are using your phone to call in. Once again, the queue is only open for agenda item E, public input, and those are for items not already listed on the agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Frosto, it's very appreciated. So uh, we're now gonna go to uh, uh, item F, which is the district superintendent's comments and the COVID-19 update. And I just wanna uh, share with the public that at the board's request, and thank you so much, Dr. Hansen and your staff, we're, I know many of y'all are, uh, we know many of y'all are, are parents at home and, and you're working with your children on the online learning. And we wanna be sure that everything COVID related is early in the meeting. 
And so you can get it early and, and get kids to bed and eat dinner and all of that. So now I'd like to introduce our district superintendent, Dr. David Hanson. Dr. Hanson. Yes, thank you, President Hunt, and good evening, board members, and good evening to all the public and staff members who are joining us this evening. As the team uh, gets up to the COVID slides, let me first give a brief introduction, though, for all those that are joining us this evening in the board study session. The board this evening is going to hear two reports from staff. The first is our district's plan to address and mitigate the learning losses occurred this past year due to the pandemic which is, as we all know, caused such a disruption to our routines in our lives. And, and of course, spending entire year, almost entire year teaching and learning virtually has not been easy. And we're gonna share with the board our plans to mitigate that learning loss. The second report that the board is gonna study this evening, it's been, uh, it's, it's been almost about a year or 18 months that there's been a group studying and looking at all of the attendance boundaries for our schools. And I'm very grateful for the members of the RUSD team who's participating in this study and prepared for tonight's study session. That's the second topic the board is gonna study this evening. So again, thank you. But now on with the COVID report, if those slides can please come up, I'd like to ask Assistant Superintendent Tim Walker just to give an update. And let me share with the public too, that you've heard us this year talk about, we've gotten pretty good, although it doesn't make it any less frustrating frustrating, but pivoting because, this, of course, we take directions from public health and we take directions from the state. And the report that we're given this evening was as recent information as earlier today. But we're also hearing that they're doing work in Sacramento and the things that we share this evening might be completely different tomorrow morning. Now, that's the frustrating part because we're ready to open up schools. However, the state is... Uh, making the decisions and doing some things up and down the state that uh, Tim will talk about a little bit more details as uh, he gives this report. So Mr. Walker, can you start with uh, the COVID report and spend a little bit of time and Miss Lee, feel free to jump on or, or excuse me, Miss, Miss Hill, feel free to jump on if you'd like to as you, we learn about what we have to have the state legislature approve for us to move forward. So Mr. Walker. Thank you, Dr. Hanson and uh, President Hunt, members of the board. Uh, members of the public, um, hope tonight finds you in good health and spirits. Um, what you see before you this evening is uh, the answer to questions of, of what was required to reopen campuses. And as uh, Dr. Hansen alluded to, we are following all the requirements and guidelines from the state of California. That uh, entity, the governor and the state of California legislators are what are uh, developing the requirements for getting students back into in-person, on-campus learning opportunities. Uh, so what you'll see here to this evening is that the Safe Schools for All plan approved by the legislature was one of the requirements as early as the beginning of closed session, the state sent out uh, new information that that is going to change. There is a new plan. Uh, there is a plan that will be required by the district, the second one here, approve the safe schools plan um, for us and for the um, state, that those plans probably are not going to be the plans that have to be approved any longer. The state is requiring a new plan to be submitted by April the 1st uh, by all school districts, and that, um, that details of that plan will be forthcoming. Uh, we have to dig into it because it literally just came out. But what is going to stay in place is the tiered system. And uh, we hope to have more information about the effect of that tiered system on the elementary, because as of this morning, the TK6 adjusted case rate for the county of uh, Riverside was approaching that number of less than 25, which would have been one of the elements required to return to school. We'll have to see if that remains one of the elements or if we go back to the tiered system that is required for 712, the adjusted case rate of seven, less, seven or less per 100,000 and less than 8% positivity rate um, on the red tier of the tiered system for return to um, in-person learning that was in place pr previously. So might sound complicated uh, where we're going to be adjusting our uh, selves to this new information from the state, 
But the key element to understand is that we are required to, and we have been, and we will continue to follow the requirements of the state of California, the governor and the legislature in regard to when we can reopen. Um, and we will do that diligently and as quickly as possible following the guidelines that they are providing to us. Thank you, Mr. Walker. I was there for Dr. Hansen and uh, Ms. Hill in case there's any more. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Walker. Can I have the team show the next slide, please? I know Mr. Walker talked briefly about this, and you can see that on the left is the adjusted rate. And currently, the current plans were that we could bring back elementary when that adjusted rate got below 25. And you can see uh, where we're currently at with the last blue bar on the right. We're just above 25. The red line at the bottom shows an adjusted rate of 7%, as Mr. Walker said. and we need to be below that to bring secondary back. At least that was as of today. Now things might change tomorrow. And then you can see the positivity uh, a chart on the right-hand side, which also applies to secondary. We need to have a positivity rate of less than 8%. You can see we're currently at. So while we're getting close, uh, those bars may change. The adjusted rate may change. Uh, we're, we're, we're watching very closely up in Sacramento but I'm grateful for, for Mr. Walker doing this. I think there was another slide there too, if the team can go forward on that next slide. These are some additional updates that are available. Um, the vaccines, we are uh, Riverside Curative, Curative Vaccination Clinic and Riverside Convention Center has been providing support uh, to our workforce to be able to have appointments available to get the vaccine. Um, we had 1,100 uh, vaccinations available on February the 5th in partnership with the Harupa Valley Unified, uh, the Harupa Unified School District. And um, those were provided to all of those who made appointments. And then we continue to work with the public health and additional opportunities for our USD staff to get vaccinated. As a matter of fact, today, an additional 300 uh, vaccination appointments were made available. Um, and we sent that uh, email out to our staff um, just an hour before the, um, the board had closed session and they went very quickly. So we are continuing to reach out and to procure additional opportunities for our workforce to be able to make appointments to get vaccines for those who are uh, very interested in getting those vaccines. Remember that they are highly recommended uh, to have a vaccine as we get ready to return to school. And then the uh, preschool to adult transition moderate to severe special education classes have been in uh, the cohort sessions since uh, they began on December the 7th. They uh, preschool um, Monday and Tuesday AM program and the Thursday and Friday PM program have been in place. And the TK through adult transition uh, have been attending on Mondays and Tuesdays. Uh, the preschool and elementary mild moderate special education classes began this week on Tuesday and the preschool um, and and the, there was also one on February uh, 18th today where all of the elementary um, mild moderate classes came back. So now we have a full continuum of pre-K through uh, sixth grade mild moderate uh, um, going on and we have a full continuum of preschool through adult moderate to severe classes going on. A total of 91 classes at uh, close to 40 schools in our district, uh, mm -hmm. accommodating over a thousand students uh, in those classes. So we're very happy to report that. We also have the um, small cohorts uh, expansion, which I just mentioned, and will be considered as uh, COVID numbers improve and reopening uh, we will have guidance uh, that is finalized. So we continue to provide for the learning hubs and our cohorts for meeting the needs of our students with special needs. Uh, and we are going to continue to provide you information related to when we can uh, open, given the guidelines that we started this uh, conversation about in, in Sacramento and from the governor's office. So Dr. Hansen, back to you or Ms. Hill, if you have any further comments on this topic. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Walker. You know, and with what Tim was talking about, what I mentioned that we were hearing late breaking news. I mean, it is, it's Senate Bill 86. Uh, we're trying to figure out if it passed both houses or, 
or didn't it pass, but we should find out with, certainly within the next 24 hours and board and community will certainly let you all know and let the staff know if indeed the, the call to pivot has occurred one more time. Haven't received anything officially in writing yet from a couple advisors uh, who you know that we work very closely with and with the legislator, legislatures, but uh, we will let you know as soon as we find out. And then in the morning, I do have a meeting with our local senator and a couple of our assembly representatives. And so we'll find out more about that too. So just to keep you posted. So late breaking news, but we're not exactly sure what it all means. And so let us wrap our minds around that. And then of course, we'll, we will uh, move forward. Hopefully we can get our kids back soon and it's not gonna get con uh, more convoluted than it may already appear from our leaders at the state with public health and things such as that. So thank you very much. And that concludes my report for this evening. President Hunt, back to you. Thank you, Dr. Hansen. To enhance uh, this important report, uh, I, I'm gonna ask you to take questions from the board uh, right now too. And uh, so this will help folks at home know what's, uh, you know, where we all stand. So uh, it, do I have, uh, questions from from my trustees um, to for Dr. Hansen, uh, Mr. Walker, et cetera, at this time. Uh, Trustee Lee, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hunt. Um, Dr. Hansen or someone on staff, can you bring up those slides again in that first that first slide? It has the list of I think five things. You're muted, Dr. Hansen. Yes, if the communications team would pull that back up, please. Thank you. All right. So just as a refresher for, for myself and then probably those that are paying attention tonight, I know I've received, uh, as I'm sure that my board colleagues have too, uh, lots of emails about uh, concerns about returning back to school with the numbers heading in the direction that they are. And then obviously a lot of excitement from parents as we get closer to those thresholds, uh, at least for our TK6 that were, were shared with us the last couple months. Um, but yeah, I, I was reading on the Sacramento uh, B. Um, about Senate Bill 86, uh, and it appears that there is a, the Senate Bill 86 is called the Safe Open for Schools Plan. So I'm assuming that plan is different than the plan that we've already built. It is, Trustee Lee. The plan that we built was due on February the 1st. We turned it in to our public health. We got some feedback. We made some adjustments, and it's back in. And that's the current plan that needs to be approved. And we're hearing that Senate Bill 86 uh, causes for a second plan that would need to be rewritten and submitted in April. But uh, you're correct, Trustee Lee, it's a completely different. So that's, that's what I'm reading now, yeah. It says that it would reopen by April under the new plan. Um, so in the event that on, I mean, in the event that this Senate bill passes as it's, it appears to be written at, at this current time, uh, even if on Tuesday when new numbers are released and if, if we're under 25 and we meet these other criteria, the plan that we've currently submitted that would allow us to uh, return potentially back to school, um, which our MOU has already been uh, agreed to, and our schools have all the uh, the, the, the screens and the, all the sanitizing that we need. All of that would, I won't say for, wouldn't, would be for not, but that would no longer be the metric in which we would return kids back to school. Correct. I understand the metric would change. I understand that the new plan would need to go back to our associations and back to the table again. And the new plan would also need to go to the state for approval. So, uh, so we yeah. should keep keep paying attention to Sacramento and the legislature and see if the metrics change from what they are today before we get any excitement one way or the other about returning to school. Correct. Correct. It's the Sacramento and public health are all the ones making the decisions right now for local districts up and down the state. Well, I think regardless of what side of the fence you lie on about when we should return to school, I know I'm frustrated that this this bar continues to change and becomes a moving target. So it makes it extremely difficult for, um, I know you all as staff to plan in terms of making sure everything's in place so our schools are safe when kids return. And I know it makes it very frustrating for parents uh, and guardians to have to plan uh, their schedules uh, and and figure out where their kids are going to be from week to week. So uh, appreciate that we are on top of this. And while we don't have control over these metrics or the time frame, that we're trying to be prepared so that when the state does say we can go back, that we can go back. So thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Lee. Uh, Trustee Allen. 
Thank you. Um, I've had quite a few emails lately about um, aren't, why are not we um, proceeding with waivers? Could you tell me if that waiver program still exists and what the status is of that? I'll let, uh, I'll let uh, Tim Walker speak to that, but the new governor's plan actually, the, it kind of trumped the waivers. And so Tim, do you want to talk about the, the- Yes, once we, actually, once we started to create the plan for the, the current plan that we submitted, uh, had resubmitted just recently after getting some feedback, uh, and now it looks like that plan is not going to be the plan that the state is going to utilize. They have a new plan they want us to write. Um, they removed the ability for districts to apply for waivers regardless of the level of the uh, COVID adjusted case rate. Um, so the elementary waiver that previously was available uh, was removed as an option and availability to school districts. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Alavi. Any other questions from our, our Board of Education? All right. Uh, uh, yes, Dr. Farouk, Trustee Farouk, thank you. It's a very small note, uh, just to, but to say that um, my understanding of SB 86 is that it's actually mid-April, um, not necessarily at the beginning of April, of what the, the targeted time frame that it could schools could reopen. It. Is that your so opinion? Yeah, well, well, so the plan's due by April 1st, and so Dr. Fruk, it seems like mid once a plan gets approved, it probably would be mid-April. And so I'll just throw this back to the board tonight, and of course, I don't want to get ahead of this uh, ourselves, but let's say that that is the time mid-April. School ends for us in May. You know, how long do we stay on this path, or do does the board eventually make a decision that says enough's enough, like some surrounding districts have done? let's just finish virtually. That's a future discussion. I mean, we're going to, as a staff, bring to the board to have a discussion. But uh, I mean, come mid-April, we're four weeks away from promotions and graduations, and the board just needs to remember that. Thank you, Dr. Hansen. It's very insightful. Uh, and uh, can you, uh, you know, I know that some of the surrounding districts have already announced they're not going back, but share with us, and as you've talked with, with the, the fellow trustees and I, as to why our USD uh, doesn't make that statement now and and uh, what we're trying to serve in our community. Just with well, that. a lot of districts, I mean, or so some of the surrounding San Bernardino, Valverde, Harupa, they made the statement, but then under the plan that might be the obsolete plan as of right now, a lot of them were backtracking that statement. I think all of them but Harupa were backtracking that statement. And every community has their own reasons why they're making this decision, right? It's local control and the state's allowed us to do that. But here in our community, as we've done surveys and we surveyed the, the in-person, remember we gave our families three choices. 60% 6, of the families chose the in-person model. So we're talking about that 60%. We surveyed them and the majority of them wanted to come back when it was safe. It was a little over 80%. And so our desire was to come back as quickly as we could when it is safe and when our plans approve, but you can see the ever moving target. Now, one thing that I am very, and that was again, the direction that the board gave us because based upon the feedback you got from uh, many of your uh, constituents, one thing that we're very pleased of, and you heard in that report that Tim gave tonight is since October, we've had the small cohorts, 17 or fewer in a class. And we've had nearly a thousand students as of this week being serviced by those small cohorts allowed by public health to do, even though you're in that high purple tier because it's safe. And you know that we have every cohort up and working. We've had to close down a few for 14 days to quarantine and bring them back up. I think that's happened five or six times, but for the last couple of weeks, they've all been up and going. So it's good that we're able to do that. Um, you know, it is frustrating, Trustee Lee. It is, it's very frustrating that it appears, and I don't want to be inappropriate, but it appears that the decision for local districts to come back has turned political in Sacramento and with things such as that. And so, you know, we'll work with public health. We want to keep our parents safe, our kids safe, our students safe, and certainly be, be good soldiers, if you will, and fall in line with what's, what we're being told from public health. And in Sacramento, it doesn't mean it doesn't make it any, least, uh, any less frustrating for me as the superintendent. And I'm just expressing that this evening. Oh. Here we're ready to go. I think we're ready to open up as, as early as next week. And we're finding that perhaps we can't. Perhaps we can't open that up till mid-April, which causes me to think, huh, are we going to make it back this school year? So we have another board meeting on March the 4th. We'll know more about that. We'll bring it back to you 
of course, we'll communicate this with our community and with staff and things such as that as we get direction from the state, from our leaders up there uh, regarding Senate Bill 86. Thank you, Dr. Hansen. And just for this, this uh, trustee, I'm, I'm glad to hear you're going to be uh, with other Western uh, County superintendents uh, speaking to our legislators tomorrow, our local ones, Mrs. Uh, tr uh, Assembly Person uh, uh, Cervantes and Medina and, and Senator Roth. But they need to understand, in my opinion, it, and what I think following up on some uh, summary and rising Mr. Lee's comments, that uh, we are on the whipsaw end of, of all of this, that, that we have 30, uh, 40,000, uh, 40,000, excuse me, 4,000, 40,000 students and their parents. And uh, we just can't make decisions that they keep moving the, uh, the goalposts. And uh, I don't know how to say this to them, but they and the governor need to get together, have one plan and for California and, and let's move forward. This is ridiculous what it does to our parents. Mr. Lee, as we saw, is, uh, has three children at, at home or, or our USD. And there's, it's, it, you know, his wife and he both work. It's tough to make the, and this is true throughout the district. It's just tough to make, make the uh, decisions to the best interest of your family. It is. So thank you. Yeah, yes, sir. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, that's right. Let me just finish with this. Remember, <laughs> this is hot off the press and sometimes you get out too quickly. And maybe I did that tonight and it's all wrong. <laughs> we'll get stuff in writing. We'll get it from Sacramento and then we'll turn and report. But it, it looks like that this is a reality, but until we see it in writing, I have a trustee, a good friend of mine, who said, trust but verify. I want to trust that we got it, but now we need to verify that it's accurate. And so we'll verify that and let the board know. And if we if we can still open up as as the plan, like next week or early March, then we'll get that word out there. But let us verify the information we got, and then we'll get back to you, to President Hunt, and all members of the board. Thank you. Well, you know, and the public, I think, understands that the Board of Education, wherever we are in the 1,014 districts in California, don't have the authority to bring people back without the legislature. They need to provide with, with Governor Newsom the leadership, and let's pick a plan. So thank you very much. Ms. Frosto, do we have uh, folks that are ready to submit public comment on, on the superintendent's report and the COVID report? We do have public input. We have two members. Our first one, Sorry, I miscounted. We have three. Well, may I say first, and that was my mistake, uh, Ms. Frosto. Uh, public comments are limited to three minutes uh, prior to, uh, according to board policy and, and the Brown Act. Uh, one chore that is incumbent upon me, uh, ladies and gentlemen out there, that as the meeting chair is to ensure that the three minutes is adhered to as best as possible. And uh, I know it's not easy to make comments in three minutes, but please help me out. Do your very best to stay within that. Uh, allow me to add for clarification uh, and that pursuant to the California uh, law and the public, uh, the Brown Act, uh, that board members specifically after your comment can ask a clarifying question or make comment. Otherwise, though, we don't really go into it. We're not ignoring you. And, uh, and as, as an advisory, uh, if you would, if you're calling to express a concern or ask a question, which very likely either I or, or one of my colleagues will ask Dr. Hansen to look into, but if we have to get back with you, you know, please, you don't have to, it's not legal, legally required, but please give us your name and, and context so we can do that. So with that brief tutorial, Ms. Frosto, please uh, welcome our, our first uh, call. Yes, I will go ahead and close the queue now with our four members and call on our first uh, public comment. And that is Ramona Student. Ramona Student, you may go ahead and unmute and you have three minutes. Good evening, Superintendent Board, President Hunt, and esteemed members of the board. I am a senior at Ramona High School, and I stand before you as a voice to represent my support for the Student Bill of Right. As previously mentioned in previous board meetings, we believe it is integral for schools to protect the rights of all students and ensure that students feel equipped and prepared to continue their education, even in challenging and adaptive circumstances such as shown during COVID-19. As students, we have recognized the need to protect the rights of students to obtain a quality, impactful, and supportive education to succeed in life. We must give students and admin an easy access to a document of students' fundamentals rights for reference. It is essential to have an equitable and comfortable environment where we become participating and successful members in society. Within the years of my education, I have encountered several instances where I as a student felt prohibited from opportunities on my voice not being heard. 
I have witnessed and encountered personal experiences as well where biases were heavily influenced on providing opportunities to students. Students were not often prioritized and delegated to whether we were eligible for opportunities offered at school. Alongside that, we want to encourage more students to become involved in our society, in our community, and in our school. We want to offer and ensure students have accessibility to resources where we feel confident and competent we will graduate. Confidence that students are protected and supported by our primary educators. Students are the primary stakeholders in their education and should serve as equal partners in the education they received. During this occurring time, COVID-19 has exacerbated to students in highest need where essential services are at utmost priority to these students, specifically no noticing and supporting our mental health. The Student Bill of Rights is supported by students. The Student Bill of Rights is written by students and for students. We must remember that students are surrounded with remote distance learning, social distress, increased anxiety over the digital divide, and how isolation has affected us all negatively. I support the Student Bill of Rights because it allows students like me to access my rights. I support it because it allows us to have a student voice platform. But most importantly, it allows us to ensure accurate representation of all students where we are more than just a number. The Student Bill of Rights allows us to feel heard, to feel supported, and have a commitment with our educators that we are prepared with the right tools to succeed in life. The Student Bill of Rights is simply to prioritize the rights of our students and allow civic engagement as opportunities for students. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Ramona Student. I know I speak for all of us. I'm confident I can say that. We're very proud of that and, and, uh, and, and you're speaking up. Dr. Hansen, you and I are meeting tomorrow with, with Mr. Lee to set the agenda. I think we have this item scheduled in mid-March. Is that correct? Dr. Fruit brought it together. Is that is that correct, Dr. Hansen? Do you yeah, we'll dis we'll discuss it tomorrow and look at the timing and the board calendar. All right. Well, thank you, young lady. And that was we agree with that. Ms. Frosta, who who do we have next calling in, please? Next, we have a caller identified as student. You may go ahead and unmute, and you have three minutes. Good evening, President Hunt, Superintendent Hansen, and esteemed members of the board. I am a student in RUSD who has realized a great need for the Student Bill of Rights to ensure the needs of students. We've recognized the amazing efforts that you have put forth for student voice, and it is greatly appreciated. With COVID-19, we've seen that distance learning has exacerbated learning loss, chronic absenteeism, underlying mental health disorders, grief, loss, and ever so much more that students endure every day. And it's not just students, but it's teachers as well. We need your support to ensure the rights of students by introducing this working document to all students of RUSD so youth voices can be heard and understood. Every voice matters, and our hope is that every student's voice is represented in this document. This strives to prioritize strong student engagement and participation, as we believe that is crucial to the success of any California school district. Civic engagement is prioritized on the Board of Education, therefore we should uphold it. With upholding students, we can provide a platform to speak out against the injustices in their community, which can better be enabled through the Bill of Rights, which ensures the accurate representation of and equitable access of all students. Thank you again, um, the Board of Education, and all of your support and time. Thank you, young lady. I, we really appreciate it. They're very invigorating. I look forward to the discussion on this. And you're right. Uh, you're our future. That's what, that's what the RUSD is. Is, is, a, is about creating the future. And so we do want to help you have a voice. Uh, Ms. Frosto, would you please uh, help us with the next caller? Yes, our next caller is Chanel Moon. Chanel, you may go ahead and unmute and you have three minutes. Good afternoon, Superintendent Hansen, Board President Hunt, and esteemed members of the board. I am a senior at Ramona High School and I stand before you today as a voice to represent my peers to express the significance of the Student Bill of Rights. As you may know, the Student Bill of Rights was created in an effort to enumerate the rights of students. We believe it is, an, it is important for students to have the opportunity to obtain a quality education, most importantly, in a good work environment to help them succeed. It is, general, it is greatly appreciated that our proposal is being heard and we recognize the districts made major steps in providing equitable opportunities, such as the creation of a district equity task force. And while there are there are incredible steps to the great future. We must ensure and prioritize the rights of our students. Through my last 12 and a half years in the Riverside Unified School District, I have experienced plenty of moments that could have been prevented had I had the beneficial opportunity to have a student bill of rights. Some of the more relevant incidents would be a part of equal opportunities. I have witnessed plenty of times where only specific students were only told 
Ooh, sorry. We're very specific students. We're told about specific opportunities by counselors, opportunities that I would have at least liked to know about. A huge one for me that I would have appreciated is considering students' mental health. Through all my years in school, there have been times where I was completely burned out and wish I had some, somewhere to relax and people to talk to about the stress. Students being given these small examples of opportunity can make a huge difference in their success with their education. I acknowledge that our peers have experienced social, emotional, environmental, and educational concerns that have led to disadvantages. The Student Bill of Rights would give our peers the advantages of having the support they need for their education. It is essential that we remember the Student Bill of Rights made by students for students was created to improve student achievement so that all stu students graduate college and career ready and have the appropriate resources needed to thrive, as well as to ensure the safety and well being of all. Please prioritize the rights of your students by accepting the Student Bill of Rights to be a part of our district. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Ms. Moon. Ramona is checking in tonight, and we appreciate it. That's very good, and you're right. Uh, we, equity does include everyone in it, and you have a voice, and, and I know we're interested in that. Ms. Frosto, you uh, have the next caller, please. The next caller is Carlos. Carlos, you may go ahead and unmute, and you have three minutes. Good afternoon, Superintendent Hansen, Board President Hunt, and esteemed members of the board. My name is Carlos Perez, and I am a student at Arlington High School. I stand before you today as a voice to represent my peers in a time of need. As students, we have recognized the need to protect students from unfair treatment. We must give students and admin uh, easy access to a document of their rights for reference. This creates a path of strengthening student protection. We propose the, the Student Bill of Rights as a working document that enumerates rights of the students. Students can use this Student Bill of Rights to gain quality education and create change directly in their district. It is essential to have an equitable system of opportunity within the, within the district. And currently it is seem to be biased. And I, excuse me, I, um, I have been, and I have experienced something that makes me feel as if I was not, as if I was not as important as the student beside me. Hmm. And I believe that we should be allowed to have the voice and have the same exact rights as our, our as our fellow students. And that's why I support the Student Bill of Rights. Thank you. Thank you, young man. Go Lions, that, that's, that's really good. And I, I know we look forward to Dr. Perez, our Assistant Superintendent for Equity, Accessibility and Community Engagement. We'll be working on this and we look forward to that report. Ms. Froster, do we have anyone else? That concludes our public input comments for this item. Thank you. I'm going to close public input now and I'm going to go to my board members and uh, for their comments. Board members are given a brief time to uh, make comments on their individual activities, but I think importantly tonight to comment on, on the COVID plan and otherwise. And I'm going to go first to our, our uh, student board member, uh, Rhea uh, Mystery, who, uh, Maria, I remember you're a poly student, is that right? Yes. All right. So uh, and of course, I'm gonna put you on the spot. Your fellow uh, students called in, but what are your thoughts? And then go from there. I don't mean to dictate you, but I appreciate it. Thank you, President Hunt, and good evening, esteemed members of the board. My student board members and I have met once again with the senior committee made up of seniors representing every high school, and we plan on meeting twice more. Mm. We're putting together our thoughts and recommendations and are prepared to present to the board on March 4th. Additionally, Dr. Perez and I met with Jenna up last Thursday to discuss ways to allow students to have access to the Student Bill of Rights, which you just heard about, and engage all levels of voices bringing, before bringing it for, forth for a first read. And to conclude my comments, I'd like to say thank you, as this is my last board meeting as Term 2's representative before Micah takes over. I'm looking forward to continuing my work off camera alongside Vanessa through the rest of the year. And I would just like to say that it's been an absolute honor and pleasure to serve and sit alongside all of you while representing our USD student population. It's been an insightful experience like no other witnessing the behind the scenes operations and all the dedication that goes into making our USD runs as smooth as it does. And I'm looking forward to the rest of our meeting tonight. Thank you. Thank you, board member Mr. And thank you for your service. We're, and, and I am impressed, we all are, how you and 
and our two other uh, student board members and our seniors are working together with Dr. Perez. Thank you, Dr. Perez. And now I'd like to call on uh, uh, Trustee Kinnear, uh, who as a principal at Poly and North for 20 something years altogether, really helped create equity. And so, and I compliment him on that. Del, uh, Mr. Kinnear, please, please, your comments. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Hunt. You know, I, I came to this uh, meeting pleased that our COVID numbers were going down. And, and, and just as, uh, as my fellow board members, I was optimistic about our return to school. And, and now I'm uh, frustrated once, once again uh, by the potential of, of changing rules. And it's, uh, it's, it's very, very difficult for, uh, for all of us. Uh, however, when I hear reports from students, like we just heard from Ramona, and when I hear Miss Mystery's uh, uh, report, as our student board member, it uh, it brings me back to uh, a, a state of mind that uh, that that does promote optimism. You know, Miss Mystery, you represented not only yourself but your your school and our school district with uh, with distinction. N nice job. Uh, since our last meeting, I visited Highland, Gage, and Arlington. I I continue to see lesson planning, organization, and teacher enthusiasm. I'm impressed with with both teacher and student use of technology, with the implementation of breakout rooms and jam boards and other instructional tools. I saw my first virtual science lab experiment. Although I'd rather be in person with hands-on opportunities, the lab was phenomenal. Teachers are working hard. I've also been impressed with my conversations with principals. I've learned a lot. In my virtual visits, I'm missing two things, however. First is the level of student engagement. You know, like teachers, I see lots of circles with an initial, but I can't always tell if uh, students are following along. Uh, virtual learning is working for some, uh, but we're not connecting with, uh, with all the students. Second, I miss the personal interaction with classified staff. I miss talking with office staff and interacting with campus aides and, and others. Uh, virtual visits just don't allow for that. I attended the District African American Parent Advisory Committee. Stay tuned for next month's talent show. I'm sure it's gonna be a great one. The PTA Founders Day program was exceptionally well organized. Special thanks to our district president, Mrs. Loyal, and to Longfellow for being this year's host. Personally, my two highlights were first, hearing comments from Longfellow's PTA president, Ms. Alexander. In addition to being a parent leader, I understand she's studying to be a teacher. I look forward to following her career in education. And second, I can't wait to meet Longfellow's Teacher of the Year, Mr. Caruso. His students were not only entertaining, but their message was touching. I also attended LULAC's annual organizational meeting. Special thanks to Yolanda Esquivel, who successfully completed her term as president of LULAC. School visits are rewarding in other ways. At Highland, I learned about John Verweel. John is 80 years old and he's the uncle of a Highland teacher. He decided to use his woodworking skills to build desks for students who needed a place to work from home during this pandemic. John designed and constructed over 100 student desks which have been given directly to students in need. I was so impressed with his story. Allison and I went to, to visit his home woodworking shop on a cold morning last week. John was busy making the various pieces of 30 more student desks. When I asked why he's doing this, John simply said he just wants to help. In addition to his skills and labor, John pays for all of the wood and materials. Thank you, Mr. Verweel. And that concludes my comments. Thank you, Trustee uh, Kinnear, and, and for that uh, involvement in our community and those insights. Well, that was very good. Uh, I'd like to go to a, a former, a very active student leader when he was at RUPA is, is Dr. Angelo Farouk, Trustee. Thank you, President Hunt. <clears throat> uh, my, I just have very brief remarks. I, I wanted to congratulate Ria Mistry, uh, our student board member for her term. And also reminder that um, even though her term is ending, she remains uh, a fully functioning student board member for the whole school year. Um, and I really just want to note that I've, I, I've observed that it seems and, and uh, you know, all of our different cohorts 
have had meaningful leadership and expressed themselves in different ways. But I feel like, um, and maybe it's just a progression of these things happening over time, but it seems like this has been the most uh, activity in broader student organizing that I've seen, you know, since we've started this program. And so really want to commend you guys because um, not just because for exercising your voice, whether it's student bill of rights or these other areas of importance, but you're doing it at a time where uh, our board needs that, that input more than ever. So thank you for doing that. Um, you know, grateful for your service. Um, and the last thing I'll just say is um, what I say in each meeting is just extraordinary gratitude to the resiliency of all of our students, um, our parents uh, and families, what, the, what they're going through and our uh, beloved employees um, for uh, everyone trying to adapt and, and make the most uh, for the sake of our students during these challenging circumstances. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Farouk, very sincere words. And now to our Dean of the Board, uh, Mrs. Kathy Alavi. Thank you, Mr. Hunt. Thank you. Um, the role of the board is clear, and I quote from our bylaws, though I know our board members already know this, that our primary goal is to provide each student with an education of the highest quality. And we have tried to do that despite the pandemic. But today's paper kind of said it all, and I quote it with um, mm. grades fall with online learning. And that's not a big surprise to anyone, and it's certainly not a big surprise to the teachers. Um, and I don't need to be convinced that our educators are all trying to do their best. I know that they are. It is just that online education, at least for this prolonged period of time, is not working for a vast number of our students. The board all received this letter from a middle school student this week. Quote, school is so hard online. Sometimes my teachers have Wi-Fi issues and is glitchy. Sometimes there are times when the teachers get kicked out of the meeting. I have not learned as much as I did before. Learning Spanish and math online is the hardest. I get so confused. I am lucky I have my grandma to stay with me during the day. I feel so bad for kids who do not have anyone and have to be alone all day. It would be so lonely. It's hard to stay focused. When my parents get home from work, we sit and go over all my work and my dad ends up reteaching me math. I feel bad for my teachers because there are only about five kids with their cameras on and only about two or three participate. I get so stressed out because I feel like everything is homework. I get so overwhelmed. I don't understand why kids in other states get to go to school and we can't. And I would have to agree with this student. Kids are falling behind socially, emotionally, and academically. My daughter has been teaching sixth grade in a private school in person since, since September. Everyone wears um, face masks and social distances and no one's gotten sick. And her experience mirrors what has now been shown in many studies across the country and the world. Scientists from the CDC concluded that the preponderance of available evidence from the fall semester suggests that schools can safely reopen as long as masking, social distancing, and proper ventilation are observed. We have invested hundreds of thousands of dollars to ensure our schools are prepared, and they are now prepared. The science on the question is fairly settled that shows daycare and elementary school children are far less likely to contract COVID and that they rarely spread it. And that's the key, isn't it? In many studies in Norway, Ireland, and North Carolina, zero instances of secondary spread. Um, teachers unions need to accept science and evidence. It's clear that in-person schooling is safe and just as clear that remote learning is marring children's lives. A Stanford study just released shows that the average student has lost three quarters of a year in math and a third of a year in reading. And this could be much higher in disadvantaged students. And it should surprise no one that 155,000 students in California have left the public school system. So I want our, our teachers to be vaccinated as soon as possible. I advocate for that but I don't want to delay a single day more than we have to to get our children back to school. And now I understand that our legislature is going to make that even more difficult, but they have to understand, and I hope that Dr. Hansen takes this message tomorrow to our legislators, that our children are hurting, our children are in trouble, 
And it is our job to see that they're educated socially, mo emotionally, and academically. And so I ask you to please uh, take that message back when you get a chance to do that. And I appreciate you giving me the chance for these comments. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Allaby, always insightful. And thank you for reading that, that really touching and, and insightful letter from our middle school student. And now a trustee and vice president of the board, Brent Lee. Thank you, Mr. Hunt. Uh, thank you, fellow colleagues, for sharing your insights. Uh, shout out to Mr. Kinnear, Trustee Kinnear, for reminding us about what school used to look like and what we have to look forward to when we do eventually get back. I think it's easy. Um, I even got, got pessimistic in the beginning of this meeting as you hear some of the frustrations that we're all experiencing as we try to get back to school. Um, but uh, it's, it's well, I, I'm not gonna try to make it all unicorns and rainbows, but it's nice to know that we, we do have such dedicated staff and educators that are doing great work despite the circumstances and students trying to stay engaged and do their best. And you see that when you visit classrooms and you go to these community meetings or probably our best insight is when our students call in and participate in public input and sharing the work that they're doing to be advocates for themselves. Or somebody like Trustee Mystery, who is not only being uh, on camera with us for the last time tonight, but her and her colleagues have been active members of this, of this board and advocating for their fellow students, not just at their school sites, but across this district. So um, there is a lot to be proud of and a lot that has been accomplished this year, um, despite some of the tough circumstances. And I and I feel the frustration that Mrs. Allaby shared as well. Um, it's it's because we want what's best for kids. We want what's best for students without with trying to keep everybody safe. Um, and we know that despite these efforts, you know, with there's headlines uh, across every newspaper in this country that talk about you know, the lack of academic progress that our kids are making. are making, And that's why we all are here, is, right, is to advocate for students and help with their academic progress so that they're prepared for life after, after 12th grade, whether that's to go to college or career. And, and we know we're not doing that as well as we have in the past, um, despite our best efforts. So I just wanna commend my colleagues for their efforts. I wanna commend the staff for their efforts. I know everybody's doing their best and uh, it's easy to get down and it's easy to get frustrated, uh, but, uh, Thank you for Mr. Kinnear and Ms. Mystery and everybody for reminding us of some of the bright spots that are happening in our district. <clears throat> I'll try to keep my comments brief. Uh, I just wanted to mention another thanks and shout out to staff uh, in regards to the program choice uh, that is happening right now um, that parents are deciding. We're trying to get a, a, a dipstick on what's gonna happen next year on where parents are gonna feel comfortable in bringing their kids back to school. And I know um, there was a lot of discussion with, with uh, our stakeholders about uh, at least our, our choice programs and the inability at this point to be able to offer a, a virtual program. Um, so I know that there was a couple meetings for DLI that parents participated. So thanks to the parents, the hundred and something parents on each meeting that participated and shared their concerns um, for both being back in person and not being back in person. Uh, so I think staff did a good job articulating uh, the, the thought that went into that decision. Um, and I'm, I'm hopeful that even though I know that parents, some parents, I think it is a small minority, are frustrated that their, their students will not have a virtual option next year. I, I think they understand the reasoning behind it now. Um, and I think it's just a good reminder that it's with decisions being made so quickly, uh, given the time constraints and just the challenges that we're all operating under, it's really important to check in with our parents and our stakeholders on these important issues and to get ahead of it as much as we can um, and, and helping parents understand why decisions are made before they find out in an email um, about, about their lack of decision. Um, I know as a parent, I'm sure a lot of you on this call are parents too can relate. The one thing we cannot stand is not having a choice. Uh, we're used to having a choice, especially in a district like Riverside Unified. So when we're not given one, uh, it's it can be hard to understand and hard to uh, hard to, and hard to reason with. So I commend the staff on on having those meetings with parents and encourage more of those types of meetings when the circumstances are called for. Um, and with that, again, I just want to thank Ms. Mystery for her contributions, being on camera with us, and I look forward to her continued work 
with uh, the team, with her fellow board members, with uh, those working on the Student Bill of Rights. And I look forward for, for the draft to come to the board at some point this year so that they can, they can be proud of that accomplishment before they leave us and graduate, that they uh, have a legacy to be proud of um, that they worked on together. So thank you. Thank you, Trustee Lee. Appreciate those comments. Well, it's, it's now my turn. Let me just, uh, first of all, my background, and then we're going to do this throughout the year, but back in 2016, the, the uh, Riverside Public, our USD Public, approved Measure O, a general a bond that uh, raised uh, $398 million uh, for us to improve schools. I don't, I don't know if everyone knows, but our USD is a near 140-year-old district. We also are considered out of 1,014 districts in the top 5%, or if I do my math right, 50. So, uh, but I want to, so this behind me is part of the Riverside Poly High School uh, project. And uh, one of the things, if you've gone to Poly ever, and uh, as my daughters did, Mrs. Allaby, some of her girls did, Mr. Lee is graduated from there, and uh, so is Ms. Allaby, that uh, Poly was built with a kind of a cascading uh, interior, which under the, American Disabilities Act doesn't really work. So let me just go over some of the, uh, Polly has had uh, 24 million uh, uh, assigned to it. And those um, items will replace and repair existing utilities and system infrastructure. Uh, Polly was built in, or opened in 1965. Uh, add shade structures and areas, areas for students to co-mingle. And these shade structures will also, uh, for, for lunch eating, Polly was built for 1600 students. If it was open this morning, there'd be 2,600 there. So, uh, and as you might have heard, the, the board last week uh, approved and, and supports the uh, uh, the measures being taken on climate change and, and expressing our concerns. So, uh, and thank you, Mrs. Allaby, and on the operations board and everyone for working on this. And thank you, the staff. Uh, the students' main entrance from the parking lot is being upgraded, and eventually that will be the the principal entrance. If you think about it, it faces central. And uh, very happy to, to announce that uh, development of an auxiliary gymnasium, Polly and many of our high schools other than King, were, Martin Luther King High School, were, uh, were built before Title IX. And so uh, just like I know at Arlington, when they opened up, they had eight sports and now they have 41, I think it is. So uh, thank you for uh, uh, WC Architects and their work and uh, Tilden Coyle, local uh, construction managers. You know, when you work with such a, talented, you serve on a board, I should say, with such a talented and uh, admirable group of, of colleagues, uh, and, you, and you speak last, uh, mainly for what my, my colleagues said, I would say ditto. ditto. Uh, but I do want to express to our community that uh, this board, uh, Dr. Hansen and the, and the 5,000 employees that, that make up Riverside Unified School District, that we are very empathetic for what's going on now. You heard Mr. Lee speak about as a parent and uh, how tough it is. And uh, we want you to know that every, we, we had a retreat, I think I mentioned that our board gold setting retreat, every single goal is connected to the COVID-19 and the learning loss and all of that. And I think it probably will be for several years to come. The quality of a school system, like in Riverside, directly equates to the quality of your community. And we take our responsibility very serious. But I want you to remember too that that uh, we're we're public servants. We are uh, community members, and most importantly, we are your neighbors. Uh, we've all graduated from local high schools, and well, I said I think Mr. Kinnear came from Ohio, but he he ran some local high schools for like I said twenty something years. And uh, we're going to do everything we can to always listen to you, and. As, as you heard Dr. Hanson, we talked with our legislators, and you should too, uh, that we've got to have a real plan and make a commitment to, to local control and, and our children and, and not to the inside the beltway, so to speak. Uh, under, under Trustee Alavi's leadership last year, uh, as president of the board, uh, we were hit in early March, and on March 13th, we we had to make the decision to close the schools. And it's, it's the most unprecedented time, obviously, in our, our planet, obviously in America, and certainly in the American education system, which wasn't built for this. But I'm very proud, as, as my colleagues mentioned, of our staff, how they have adapted it, have Dr. Hansen said, have continually pivoted 
And as Mrs. Alavi alluded to, that every student uh, of our district, 40,000, have a laptop, have, uh, have, if they don't have internet at home, we have, they have hotspots, et cetera. And thank you, uh, Ms. Hill, our uh, Chief Academic Officer, Superintendent-Elect uh, Renee Hill for leading those efforts uh, along with Mr. Walker and others. Um, you know, I, we heard when this all started uh, back in March and beginning of the year, we, we're in this together. And uh, yes, we are, but I know that this most unusual year in, in the United States where uh, has been challenging, where the George Floyd incident, the tragic incident, uh, the, but, but it did spark, it did, it did help lead the Black Lives Matter. And, uh, and, and we've seen our Congress that can't seem to agree on the color of the, of the paper they're gonna use. Uh, we've had economic hardships in this city. Many of our friends and colleagues who own small businesses won't be opening up again. And, uh, and that's very tough in our economy. I read last night that one out of 10 uh, workers in America are gonna have to change their jobs, find a new type of career. And I imagine that's, that's even a low number. But uh, all of this being very difficult, this is Riverside. We, we have a great history. We're the first school district in the United States, 1965, to voluntarily desegregate our schools. We're a diverse community, we're an old community, and we are in this together. And, and our, I'm so proud of our young staff that came up with our, our, our motto this year, even before all this, which is to be unified. And that's what I, as your board president and a member of the trustees, encourage all of us here, including my parents I'm speaking to at home and all of us, to be unified, to come together and work together on what is a, the most difficult, as I said, problem in the, in the history of the American education, if not global. And, and let us know your thoughts, give us input. We, we are, all of us, very involved with, with our employees. And, uh, and, and when you see a teacher, you meet a custodian, a front office person, uh, thank them. And understand that, again, we're, we're whipsawed by Sacramento, but we're gonna do the best we can. So I, I conclude now the board comments and thank you so much for that. Um, I'm, I'm going to move now to action item uh, H, which is uh, it is recommended that the Board of Education approve the employment agreement with the next district superintendent. Uh, the, uh, the Brown Act requires that the governing board, prior to taking final action on an employment contract for what is called a local agency executive, uh, must orally report a summary of the key terms of the contract, including salary, salary schedules and other compensation paid in the form of fringe benefits. I will add that, that RUSD does not uh, you know, have car allowances and sale allowances and all those sort of things. Everything is, is in their salary package and that's for our superintendent and all of the cabinet. Uh, so now I'm gonna call upon uh, uh, Assistant Superintendent of Personnel Leadership and Professional Development, Ms. Kylie Ibarra, to present this agenda item and, and introduce soon our uh, the, the Board of Trustees uh, Attorney for Personnel Matters, uh, Mr. Joseph Sanchez of BB and K. Uh, and so I go forward, uh, Assistant Superintendent Alibi, thank you. I mean, not Alibi, excuse me, Yabar, I, I thank you. Mrs. Ibarra, before we do that, we do need to open the queue. So I'll go ahead and do that now. We will now open the queue to provide public comment for item H1. If you are a member of the public who has joined the Zoom call today to comment on agenda item H1, approval of the employment agreement for the next district superintendent, you may now enter the queue by using the raised hand function if you are logged in using the computer or star nine if you are using the phone to call in. Once again, the queue is only open for agenda item H1, approval of the employment agreement for the next superintendent. Thank you. And Mrs. Ibarra, you can go ahead. I, I think Tom is trying to say some things. On, you know. Thank you, Dr. Farouk, I appreciate that. I just wanted to explain to the public that, that the process will be that uh, Mr. Ibarra has the staff who will present along with, with uh, Attorney Sanchez, uh, the item, then uh, the board will, you know, please, if they can, you know, it's, hold your comments, write them down. And uh, then we will go to public comment. 
And then after that, we will close public comment and, and the board will, will proceed. So uh, with that, I'll be quiet and ask Assistant Superintendent Yabara to, uh, to proceed. Thank you so much. Thank you, President Hunt, Dr. Henson, and members of the board. Um, my job right now tonight is just to present to you Joseph Sanchez, who is a partner at Best Best in Krieger, and he actually oversees all of our contracts with regards to superintendency and the cabinet. So at this point, I will turn it over to Joseph Sanchez. Thank you. Um, board president and, and, and members of the board, uh, I'm here, and, and, and members of the public, I'm here to, uh, to go through the key terms of uh, the agreement uh, for superintendent with superintendent-elect Renee Hill. Um, the proposed contract will be for a four-year term to run from July 1, 2021 through June 30, 2025. The superintendent will receive an annual salary of $320,000 commencing commencing July 1, 2022, and annually thereafter for the duration of the agreement, the superintendent's base annual salary shall be increased by 2% upon the receipt of a satisfactory or better annual performance evaluation for the previous school year. The superintendent will also receive the same health and welfare benefits package and leave benefits that are provided to other academic management employees at a current annual cost to the district of $12,180. Other fringe benefits include uh, $150,000 life insurance policy uh, and a disability insurance policy during her employment as superintendent, and also for reimbursement for actual and necessary expenses incurred within the scope of employment. And those are the key terms of the agreement. Uh, with that, I'll turn it back to the board president. You're on mute, President Hunt. You're, you're on mute. You know, I can, I empathize with that middle schooler that, about uh, how difficult this is. So uh, I've been a long time since I've been in middle school. So uh, now uh, that will conclude right now the staff report and I will ask Ms. Frosto for uh, public comments and to proceed with that, if there are some on this item. Yes, we have one comment. The queue is now closed and we'll call on that one comment. Sandy, you may go ahead in just one moment. Let's get the screen up for the timer. And you can go ahead and unmute. You have three minutes. Hello, I apologize that I'm speaking out of the agenda topic area. Um, however, I was not able to do so while I was driving. So I would like to touch on the COVID issue. And I do appreciate that the board finally expressed um, the difficulty that our students are facing. Um, as a parent, I know that my kids have struggled where they previously never struggled before. And I just felt that I had to respond to these comments because at this point, the board is making it sound like this is all on Newsom and this is all on the state and we have to wait for the legislature. But I wanna remind people that the board had an opportunity to open when we were in red. They had an opportunity to request a waiver and they failed to do so based on the pressure that they received from the teachers unions. The teachers unions called into every single school board meeting that we've had during this COVID. Um, situation. Teachers have commented stating that they did not want to return. So there were many opportunities where our kids could have returned. Orange County has been back this entire time. You know, I've had to listen to comments um, from people like Tom Hunt saying that um, who are our kids falling behind? They're falling behind other districts. They're falling behind other states. And I'm glad that the board finally acknowledges that but it's too little too late now. And I want you to know that us parents are fed up and we are holding that board accountable because you chose to side with the unions and you chose not to put our kids first. And that to me as a parent is unacceptable. As the board, you have received $76 million in COVID aid for the district. 
So I hope, or six, yeah, 76 or $67 million in COVID relief for the district that as a parent, I would like to know how that's being utilized to protect my kids when they do return. And hopefully there won't be any delays at the start of the fall school year and I know that I'm not the only parent that feels this way. I know other parents have an issue with calling in and don't, don't want to call in. And if I have to be a voice for some of them, I'm, I'm glad to do so. But the accountability lies with that board. And you need to own the fact that our kids are not at school. And it's because of you. Because you voted not. You looked at the, the teacher survey and you chose not to request a waiver. And you chose not to go back when we were in red. It, it lies with you. And on a separate note, this is to Tom Hunt. Um, I would appreciate it if your campaign signs would be removed. They were due to be removed um, 10 days after the election. And I have contacted you and the board um, repeatedly. And mm -hmm. I still have to look at your campaign sign on the side of the road every day when I come home on the corner of La Sierra and Blackburn. And I would appreciate it if you could take the time to remove your trash. I have filed a complaint with the county um, because you had 10 days after the election to remove those. And I know there's more throughout the city. So as one of your constituents, I would appreciate it removed. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Parent Sandy. And I, I will comment not on, on your accusations against me. I do need to pick up my signs. But uh, as to the attacks on the teachers, that uh, I'm going to remind you that California is, is not a right to work state, that all public money must be negotiated with the public employees and it was not that way, but I also would like Dr. Hansen, that's, that's, I know, and Dr. Hansen is a great example of how we need to improve communications. Is Orange County opened all this time? The, the public schools, not, and, and I believe they're, they're in purple as well. Go ahead, sir, just quickly to help the, the folks out there thinking, uh, listening to Parent Sandy. My understanding, Mr. Hunt, is that it varies up and down the state. It's a local decisions. Uh, while San Diego County and Orange County and some counties up north have been able to return, and I think most of the districts have, they've all come back differently. Hybrid model, distance learning, um, uh, homeschool type stuff yeah. that we have, and so it is different. They've left it up to local decisions, uh, local districts to make that decisions, and we're seeing a, a variety of decisions being made up and down the state in, in different regions. And, and did I make a mistake or our board that it is up to the legislature? We, we follow what they, and I'm not throwing it back on Governor Newsom, but all of them, that, that is how the school districts must, must operate. Is that just correct? The, the guidance we receive are from our legislatures and, and public county or public health, state yeah. public health leaders and county public health leaders. And it's very, very different again, up and down the state. So we do, we do uh, take our direction from them. Thank, thank you for the in, indulgence of the board. I wanted to make sure that we, we have correct information out there and we it, it shows that we need to do a better job and we're committed to it, to getting across the facts. But let's go back to our agenda item. And does that finish uh, public comment, Ms. Frosto? Yes, it does. Thank you so much. So I'll close public comment and now we'll go to the board. Uh, if there's any questions before we take a roll call vote on action item H1, the employment agreement for the next superintendent, that was Chief Academic Officer Renee Hill. Board? Thank you, Dr. Farouk, please. I just wanted to um, ex express my appreciation um, to you, President Hunt and uh, Vice President Lee for uh, all of your proactive efforts in going through this process and uh, our appreciation for Mr. Joey Sanchez for um, negotiating something in such a seamless manner and obviously our superintendent elect, uh, Renee Hill, um, for, uh, for willing to step up during this time so we could have this continuity. Um, just the whole team aspect, it, for everything to go this smoothly for us to have such strong continuity of leadership is, is an extraordinary thing that shouldn't go um, underappreciated. So um, just wanted to say that, and I'm happy to make a motion unless other people have questions. Thank you, Dr. Fruger. I'm gonna wait to see if I have any other questions on the contract, the motion, et cetera, for many of my fellow trustees. And I, I don't see any. I'm happy so to I'm, second. I'm happy oh, to I'm second. Oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Mr. Lee. I, I cut off my vice president. I was, I was just going to, if there was no further questions, I was going to second the motion. Um, and and uh, that's it. Okay. So the, the motion is, and, and seconded by, uh, motion by Dr. Farouk, seconded by Trustee Lee. 
that we would move forward with the uh, contract as proposed and, and outlined by our attorney, uh, Joseph Sanchez. So I will now take a roll call vote and just clarify that uh, uh, student board members are not allowed to vote on anything that has to do with employment and compensation, et cetera. So with respect to uh, board member mystery. So uh, I have a motion and a second. Uh, may I, uh, e either I or, or nay from Mrs. Allaby? Uh, I vote yes. Thank, thank you, Trustee Allaby. Trustee Kinnear? Yes. Trustee Farouk? Yes. Trustee Lee? Yes. And the president votes yes. That, that passes and uh, we will move forward. Uh, Ms. Hill, we're looking forward to uh, you, you leading us. Uh, we want to express our thanks to, as we said last week, to Dr. Hansen for building a bench and we were able to promote inside. And, and I think that's, that's important to our community. And uh, I should mention too, that in the last 18 months, four of Dr. Hansen's assistant superintendents and now Ms. Hill have been, have been uh, picked as superintendents of, uh, around the, uh, this area. So uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't say anything. Ms. Hill, would, our chief academic, would you like, officer, would like to say anything or everything? Uh, thank you, thank you, President Hunt. Just that I'm, I'm humbled and honored to continue to serve alongside my other 4,000 teammates. And I pledge to do my best on behalf of our students and families and community. We have no, we have no doubt, my friend. And thank you so much for your work. Um, and we now go into item I, which is study session. And I'll first ask uh, Ms. Frosto again to uh, tell us about that and, and invite the public to, uh, to uh, uh, comment. And this is under the COVID learning and engagement response. It's called the Clear Plan. Uh, Ms. Frosto, please. Yes, we will now open the queue to provide public comment for item I-1. If you are a member of the public who has joined the Zoom call today to comment on agenda item I-1, which is an update on the COVID-19 Learning and Engagement Response or CLEAR plan, you may now enter the queue until the item begins by using the raised hand function if you are logged in using the computer or star nine if you are using your phone to call in. Once again, the queue is only open for agenda item I-1. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ms. Frosto. So the, uh, the responsible cabinet member on this is Dr. Jackie Perez, our assistant uh, Superintendent for Equity, Accessibility, and Community Engagement, and she will make the presentation. Presentation, Dr. Perez, thank you. Thank you, and good evening, President Hunt, Dr. Hansen, and esteemed board members. Uh, this evening, let me adjust my screen. Uh, this evening, the Ed Services team will be discussing the COVID Learning and Engagement Response Plan, or uh, throughout this presentation, we'll be discussing how we got here, some of the steps we took at the start of the pandemic, uh, now and looking into the future, the research-based strategies, some key actions and services, and we'll spend the bulk of our time in that space, uh, connection to the LCAP process, and conclude with our next steps. So go ahead to the next slide. Back on March 13th, 2020, almost one year ago, uh, RUSD was faced with numerous challenges that impacted all of our students, staff, and families. At the start of the pandemic, we provided opportunities for learning, social, emotional care, and engagement virtually. In August, and per SB 98, we offered three program choices, all along desiring to reopen in person, but providing a robust distance learning program. And here we are now in a flexible learning environment, all very contingent on our health and safety conditions in the county and in the state. So this timeline has compounded the urgency to address the learning and social emotional recovery experienced by all. Go ahead to the next slide, please. And so from that, we recognized the need to develop a short-term plan in response to COVID's impact on student learning and well-being. Hence, the new, uh, the aptly named CLEAR plan. So go ahead to the next slide. The actions and services clearly align to the work of the team that the Board of Education has put guidance forth. On January 30th, a Board, a Board of Education study session, the board reflected on past recurring themes, the learning continuity plan actions, and the need for recovery practices to be grounded in research. Go ahead to the next slide. 
And this all pointed to the focused target to safely open campuses. This truly is our clarion call to action. Prepare for the successful opening of campuses in a manner that is responsive to our students, families, and staff recovering from the traumatic events of COVID and have experienced loss in a variety of ways. We must build our collective educator resiliency and prepare to reunify our students as they have been away from our campuses and school culture now for a year now. So uh, I thank you and I appreciate the guidance um, that has helped craft this plan. Go ahead to the next slide. So the call to action is a direct correlation to our plan. The plan is aligned to the learning continuity and attendance plan, the LCAP, the RUSC equity tenants and guide for instructional direction, which serve as the foundation. Our RUSD equity definition, um, equity is accomplished when access is based on need and every student is provided with what they individually require to learn and succeed to fulfill their academic and social advancement. Although we, we created that collective definition three years ago, it rings true ever so much right now. This plan is truly focused on providing students with what they individually require to learn. And based on the research, the recovery phase of any emergency or crisis requires additional support and attention around the mental health of students, staff, and families. Go ahead to the next slide. The actions and services in the plan are built on these five categories as the, as the foundation of research of addressing academic and social emotional recovery. Our target is to safely reopen campuses alongside addressing the social emotional behavioral and academic supports using high yield research based strategies that are intended to support students and families and support staff so they are very well prepared when students return. Go ahead to the next slide. And all of these research elements prioritize the inclusion of each and every learner. We've learned a lot from when the pandemic began, as well as the collective learnings from teachers and students. And I'll highlight just a few that you see on the screen. Learning loss, both considered academic and social emotional recovery, really addressing the intentional practices associated with students experiencing um, traumatic events. And this includes students who have been living through the pandemic, um, loss of family and friends, and also trauma that their family may have, to have experienced. Online instruction, uh, really we have some best practices that we can pull through uh, for what we have learned by experiencing it in distance learning and should include in future practice. This includes some of the digital tools and online learning resources that can be incorporated to in-person instruction. And our teachers have become quite adept at so many tools during this time. And then I'll just walk through a few more. Uh, reading and literacy in the elementary and secondary, a key practice in addressing um, is addressing summer learning loss in reading and literacy in elementary grades and tackling best practices in tier one in uh, literacy. And again, you'll hear a little bit of that um, in coming slides. Math in elementary and secondary, again, looking at some best practices for elementary and reaching every single student in secondary math. And what you see that last part, uh, which we've, hear, we've heard loud and clear, this last component really highlights the need for intentional strategies and practices for our defined student groups. These interventions are to target our at-promise students, uh, formerly called at-risk, our English learners, our long-term English learners, and also looking at best practices for our students with disabilities. Go ahead to the next slide. So over the next few slides, we will highlight key proposed actions that make the connection between the research, what we've learned, and assessing the learning and academic um, the learning and social emotional gaps and looking to current trends in English and math instruction. And most comprehensively, elevating our practice to meet the needs of every student. Our plan is taking into consideration the educational trinity or more simply the important relationship between student, parent and teacher. We will highlight the actions, the impact to student, teacher and parent. 
And these targeted actions are not comprehensive. We just wanted to pull through a few high leverage strategies and doesn't include a lot of the work happening, um, especially um, the work of the principals and their site teams, um, the collaborative working groups with our association partners. Rather, these really um, highlight the high impact actions. So at this time, I'd like Dr. Dan Sosa, Director of Research Assessment Evaluation and Technology Services, um, who will discuss the actions of, which is the next one, truly understanding each student. So you can go to the next slide, please. Thank you, Dr. Perez. And understanding the needs of every student is a core element to addressing learning and social emotional recovery. In our district, we have a long history of using assessment tools to gain a better understanding of how our students are improving. Many times over the past, we've shared with the Board of Education and community, the student's progress on assessments or screeners, such as Dibbles, which is a widely used and very reliable assessment to track reading skills progress. But in the past, this is mostly focused within the elementary grades, as you can see from the graphic on the screen which is in the top portion of the slide. You will also notice that within our screening tools, we were missing tools to gain insight into our students' academic growth within the mathematics area. But Dr. Sosa, I think you broke up a little bit there, sir. And we really didn't have, oh, excuse me. I'll, can, can I'll speak go back a little about bit two slower. That'd be great. Yeah. Yes, yes, absolutely. So over the past, we have focused mostly on the elementary grades as those were the tools at our disposal at that time. But we know that the research is clear that now we need to have a more robust system that also includes tools to address growth in mathematics and social, emotional and behavioral learning. We also know that it's clear that we need to have assessment tools that are appropriate to use at the secondary grades as well. One more piece we would like to highlight is based on some deep reflection our team has done over the last year in looking at the research, we now realize that the way we were previously using screeners was not really in alignment with research. And let me explain that a little bit. So the use of universal screening tools is one part of a robust assessment system, something in the district we call the assessment continuum, which takes uh, part in screening, diagnostics, progress monitoring tools, and standards mastery assessments. Within the past years, our practice has been to use universal screening tools to do things that they really weren't intended to do. Similar to using a screwdriver to hammer in a nail. You can do it, but, it not, uh, but it's not typically effective or um, efficient for that process. What sometimes this does is research tells us that it gives us a false sense of understanding of what students need to be successful. Since we are a continuous improving organization, we have now reimagined or reconceptualized how we're going to adopt and use universal screeners through the lenses of systems of support and equity. We have a universal screening adoption team that's made up of key stakeholders in the district such as classroom teachers and support teachers with RCTA leadership, site administration and district staff. We've met numerous times and have designed a piloting structure that we will be reviewing comprehensive screening tools in all three areas indicated by the research, uh, which is English language arts, mathematics and social emotional and behavioral learning. The timeline for that process is shown on the bottom of the screen. These tools give our teachers and students meaningful feedback that can be used to increase student outcomes, both in and out of the classroom. Next slide. These tools are not only important for teachers, but they're important for students as well. Proper use of screening tools can make a positive impact for all students and teachers in the classroom. What you see on the screen is a flow chart meant to demonstrate how screeners can permeate all the way through the entire teaching and student experience. 
The blue represents the teacher interactions and the gray represents the student interactions. First, we start off with teachers administering the assessments to their students. One of the guiding principles of our adoption team is to find screening tools that are easy and timely to assess so they don't take too much time away from instruction. The screeners are meant to focus on student skills, both from a developmental and a skills progress standpoint. Those results then help teachers to reflect on their practices so they can make modifications to their instruction, their support and extension activities to meet the needs of the students where they are. That change in practice leads to increased student learning as the teaching is more closely targeted to the skills the students have or that the students need in order to be successful in the future. Both of these processes happen within whole group instruction and also in small group instruction as necessary. Mm -hmm. Teachers regularly reflect on their students learning through multiple ways, making professional decisions on practices and strategies while communicating with students all the way through the process. This process allows the students to build a sense of agency and voice, giving them control over their own outcomes. Student agency is a hallmark of a self-directed and engaged critical life skills and they lead to future success. One thing we've learned from this COVID pandemic is the dramatic decline in our well being and social emotional health that's been spoken about um, considerably this evening. Right. It's more important than ever for students to feel that they have agency and voice over their feelings and their outcomes. So at this time, I'd like to ask Mrs. Kirsten Frausto to show us how our system is going to support the building of student agency within a social emotional framework. Thank you, Thank Director you. Uh, Sosa, and, and I going to make sure we introduce this properly, that uh, Ms. Kirsten Frosto is, is the Director of Special Education at SELPA. Please, please continue, Ms. Frosto. Thank you. There are three key areas of focus that we're going to look, look at. So as we've heard this evening, the second half of the school year, staff and students and families continue to be faced with the ever-changing circumstances it seems, and new transitions. Social emotional learning remains as important as ever and is essential in supporting students to develop healthy identities, manage and self-regulate emotions, mm -hmm. achieve personal and collective goals, feel and show empathy for others, establish and maintain supportive relationships, as well as make responsible and caring decisions. We're continuing to examine our efforts and make the needed adjustments with a focus on supportive relationships, equitable environments, and the overall well being of all of our students, as well as the adults and student learning. So, the three key areas of focus in strengthening our comprehensive system of social emotional supports that we're going to focus on the first one is working with stakeholders this spring. Similar to the process of the universal screener adoption process described earlier to identify an SEL curriculum or social emotional curriculum that supports increased opportunities for the instruction practice and reflection in the classroom. We're also very fortunate to have the SEL playbook that was developed this past summer and classroom teachers have shared with us throughout this year, the need and desire to also have a sequenced ongoing support throughout the year in the form of a curriculum that includes pre-planned ready to deliver lessons, which that can serve as either a framework or supplemental resource that's accessible to all of our students in all of our programs. The next focus area is increasing school-wide practices and policies, because we know a systematic school-wide approach to SEL is very important. It includes consistent opportunities to really cultivate practice and reflect on the social and emotional competencies, which you see there on the slide, in ways that are developmentally appropriate as well as culturally responsive. SEL is integrated into instructional content, 
and teaching strategies for academics as well as music, art, and PE. And student voice and agency, as we heard earlier, is very important. So it helps us by engaging students as leaders, problem solvers, and decision makers. And supportive school and classroom climates, it also entails a focus on adult well being, discipline policies and practices that are instructive and proactive, as well as restorative and developmentally appropriate, as well as equitably applied. And through this, we develop a continuum of supports that are connected to the academic and behavioral supports. And that way we're available, that are available, and that way we are able to ensure that all students' needs are met. We are very fortunate to have some of these foundations already in place that we can continue to build and strengthen. And our last but extremely important focus area is our family and community partnerships. And this includes continuing to partner with our parent associations, providing opportunities at not only the district level, but school site level for families to come together and discuss SEL topics, expand our partnerships with community organizations to support social emotional and recognizing and strengthening the role of after school and extended learning opportunities with social emotional learning. That actually brings us at this time um, over to extended learning opportunities, which Dr. Ryan Lewis, Assistant Superintendent of Curriculum and Instruction will go into more detail about. Good evening and thank you, Mrs. Frausto. Another key area identified through the research is extended learning. You know, prior board meetings, we've had uh, several conversations of how to provide that opportunity for our students that are in need. Uh, the four areas that we look at are reading and literacy, mathematics, how do we provide credit recovery options, and then continuing as we've talked earlier about the social emotional support. So some things thus far that we have put into place and we will continue to grow and expand are admitting tutoring services through partnerships, for example, of UCR, Hearts in Primetime, our AVID relationships, or even our pay for tutoring company that we brought in to support our students. Small group instruction, the social emotional playbook that you heard of, webinars for families to support, video resources, websites, and dedicated time in our classrooms with our teachers for social emotional support. Another support we've provided to our high school students, we've expanded credit recovery options by either one or two classes across the board at our conference of high schools to help and support students that struggled during the first semester. When we look forward to summer programs, probably our biggest opportunity to support students in expanded time. So with an anticipated direction coming from the governor's office and scenarios may be changing, tonight I'm just gonna give you a, a brief overview with a much more detailed plan coming back on March 18th with explicit uh, ideas and plans for our summer program. But things you can look forward to. Number one, we are planning a four to eight week program for elementary, middle, and high school with a mix of in-person, if permitted, and virtual online instruction for those uh, that can benefit as health conditions allow. That will run through a combination of both June and July, uh, with most of those dates being taken with opportunity for students. And those dates will be come back and solidified through the March 18th meeting. But as a rough idea, we look to start, and I'll take elementary as an example, the first of June through the end of June, running a four day a week program for that four week block. Then we'll have our 4th of July um, holiday. Then we'll come back for the rest of July and mirror that schedule as well. A four day a week for roughly 15 to 20 days of instruction, providing thousands of seats for both students and teachers to come back and get that additional time and support. Elementary and middle will prioritize students based on need. So things that we'll look at and our principals and teachers will guide us in are looking for considerations for English learners or students with disabilities or foster youth and homeless students that were negatively impacted by COVID, or even students not demonstrating mastery as we spoke about with our grade reports in the past with ones and twos in elementary school who need that additional time and support. For high school classes, we are looking at a very innovative model for both impacted schedules and credit recovery. And what I mean by that is many students that have impacted schedules need a course for what's called their original credit or they're taking it for the first time. That will be planned to continue this month, uh, this summer through the months of June and July. We also know we'll have students who will need credit recovery 
And that will be done at a mastery-based learning concept again that you'll hear more about in March, but where students will be able to progress through content by evaluating their mastery since they've already had one experience with that course. And that will allow them to progress through the months of June and, of June and July, making up credits that they may have lost throughout the year. To give you an idea to run that summer program is gonna cost us roughly six to eight to even possibly $10 million providing that amount of access to our students throughout the summer months of June and July. Additionally, we are working on partnerships with the city of Riverside, where we're looking to use their community centers for additional opportunities for social interaction and social supports for our students and more information will be coming back as well. But again, on March 18th, you'll get a very extended report on summer programs, plus our additional supports for English learners, students with disability, foster youth, homeless, and some of our students who are in greatest need. And at this time, Dr. Perez, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Lewis. The last action on the next slide builds upon some of the components that Mrs. Frausto and Dr. Lewis pointed to are our existing and growing partnerships in the community. So as we continue to work with our parent associations to support with the communication to and from families, um, including family listening circles that uh, we are implementing next week and the direct supports from school sites to their teams and the community partners that are ready to continue outreach and provide direct in-kind supports to families. I wanted to just highlight a few that you see on the screen um, that continue to provide supports to our families in different ways. So Riverside Unified Health Systems Behavioral Health, um, they provide parent training workshops designed to give parents and caregivers the tools with social emotional concerns and uh, for their children with diagnosed medical conditions. We, they also provide Nurturing Parent, which is family-centered and trauma-informed programs. Uh, they also provide Puertas Abiertas, parent-to-parent uh, -parent support groups. They have a teen suicide awareness and prevention program. Again, all of these um, that we push out and uh, share with our families. The Riverside County District Attorney's Office supports the SAR process, but also Power Parenting um, Workshop Series for um, parent support, very tangible, no-nonsense support to equip parents with knowledge and communication skills uh, to prevent bullying and drug use in their homes. Uh, another uh, partner we have is Cal Baptist University, and they uh, supply interns from the Masters of Social Work and Marriage and Family Therapy programs, um, and that further assists with the social emotional health um, in providing supports back out to our families and students. A new provider um, this year is the Asian Pacific Counseling Center, um, who is offering a uh, parenting course, Keeping Intergenerational Ties in Ethnic Families, KITE, uh, a research-based parenting program for diverse um, Asian American families. Um, and what that is doing is strengthening the parent-child relationship, increasing communication, and equipping children uh, with some tools to thrive and succeed in a multicultural society. In the summer, uh, what we're looking to offer are summer learning family webinars in June to encourage learning and social emotional wellness. Uh, we're partnering with community agencies to create summer activity packs for families, collaborating with Parks and Rec to ensure families participate in programming and can apply for scholarships, work closely with the community agencies that offer summer activities for students, including uh, community centers, the libraries, uh, community settlement house. Um, and also our SAP counselors and psychologists are included in some of the extended learning programs that Dr. Lewis also shared. So as you can see also on the slide are the key elements from the research to address the needs of families. And that's largely from an asset-based approach and seeing all of the positives that students and families come with and addressing the barriers that they have experienced. So our team is in early developments of looking to um, craft a um, parent and family engagement program, tying both the academic supports and social emotional recovery, um, and al also looking to our current partners. Uh, we're also exploring programs to expand the school to community connection. Go ahead to the next slide. 
so these actions and services are in direct alignment to both our learning continuity and attendance plan, our LCP and three year LCAP, uh, local control and accountability plan. The LCP was designed to support every student during distance learning, prioritizing student well-being through the components of online learning programs, additional social emotional support, and professional learning for staff. In planning for the LCAP, the actions and services discussed connect to the three overarching goals that you see, focused on well-designed instructional programs to recover from the impacts of the pandemic. And all are connected to the Board of Education's goals and the framework to build out these actions. And go ahead to the next slide. So our next steps are to continue to reflect and analyze results of our current actions and services, such as our outreach practices, instructional practices, and in turn, plan for professional learning accordingly to support our staff. Uh, we're aligning these actions to the LCAP process, which include continued stakeholder input and feedback and an upcoming study session in April, leading to LCAP public hearing in May and adoption in June. And also our deadlines for completion of this plan and getting feedback from various touch points of working groups and committees uh, to solidify the actions and move to implementation. So this concludes our presentation and we're open to comments and questions and discussion. May I take pu public comment first, uh, Dr. Perez? And that was wonderful and thank you, you and Dr. Lewis and Director Sosa and Frosto. So uh, Director Frosto, do we have uh, public comments on the CLEAR plan? Yes, we do. We'll wait for our timer to get posted. And Doris Garrett, you have, you may go ahead and unmute and you have three minutes. Thank you. My name is Doris Garrett and I am a retired RUSD teacher. My granddaughters who live with me are attending King High School. I'm very concerned for the safety of all the RUSD students, the families and teachers as we proceed toward this in-person instruction. We can all agree that students need to be back in the classroom. This pandemic has created learning environments that are less than ideal. But who do we look to? Being a retired teacher affords me the time to watch my cable news network. I am surprised at how quickly news develops and changes. And education is at the forefront of this. Who do we look to for information that will allow us to make well-informed decisions about what is best for our students, teachers, and staff? The state? the county, the president, the CDC. The CDC said on Monday that 75% of counties in the US are experiencing high levels of transmission considered to be red zones, while an additional 14% are experiencing substantial levels of COVID-19 spread. A CNN analysis has found that up to 89% of US children live in a county considered to be a red zone. CDC guidelines reference studies that suggest there is a link between levels of community transmission of the disease spreading to and within schools. Additionally, not all teachers will be vaccinated in time for an RUSD planned in-person instructional program. While it is true that students are less likely to exhibit life-threatening symptoms of the disease, what about their teachers, other staff members, all the extended family members whose students come in contact with on a daily basis? What about those with compromised immune systems? And new variants. New variants have caused scientists to question the effectiveness of the vaccines. I'm one of the lucky ones. I've had both vaccinations. However, I remain concerned that the return to school for my grandchildren that live with me could possibly endanger my health. President Biden says that there is not enough vaccines right now for everyone, but there will be close to the end of July. And he also says that by Christmas, we may be back to a similar lifestyle. Why then are we rushing? to get back to school now. And now with the new thing from the state, as I said, point taken, the state has got the new SB 86. So many things have changed and there is so many differences between so many different agencies and statistics are just being tossed around like tinker toys while American public tries to grapple with the ramifications. What will happen when the variants become the norm? 
Will students be supposedly still safer at school than at home? What about the parents and grandparents that live with them? What percentage of risk are you willing to take? And what will you say to that family who loses a loved one? I'm very pleased that you have taken the position to wait on this based on Senate Bill 86, and I appreciate your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's always great to hear from our retired and active educators, and thank you for your service. Go, Ms. Frosto, who, who's next? That concludes our comments oh. for this item. All right, so I'm gonna now, uh, thank you, Ms. Frosto. I'm gonna close the public comment, and uh, we're gonna go to the members of the board that might have questions regarding uh, Dr. Perez's uh, presentation on the CLEAR Act. Do I have any questions? Uh, Dr. Farouk, thank you, sir. And next is Dr., I mean, Mr. Kinnear. I can defer first to Mr. Kinnear. All right, thank you. I, I have a always go first, so. Thanks, thanks, President. Yes, I have a couple of, uh, of, of questions. Maybe we'll take them one at a time. Uh, are universal screeners uh, being selected for all language arts and math courses at all grade levels, or are we being specific to certain grade levels and certain courses? Thank you, thank you Mr. Kinnear. Uh, Dr. Sosa will respond. Thank you, Dr. Perez, and thank you, Ms. Kinnear. So the universal screeners are not course specific. They're uh, skill specific. So without getting too technical with the answer, um, the screening tools themselves are nationally normed to skill progressions students should have by certain time the year levels in order to be um, on track readers. So they can be used really um, irrespective of any ELA or reading course. Uh, Trustee Kinnear, you had a second question. Does that answer your question, sir? Yeah, no, that, 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 that's fine. Uh, you know, uh, we, we, we all recognize the, the high number of, uh, of failure rates uh, of kids failing. You know, we went from uh, 311 kids failing ninth grade English last year to, to 841 this year and 10th grade isn't, uh, isn't much better off. And in math uh, one alone, uh, we have uh, over 1200 kids who are, are failing. Uh, my question specifically is with the dramatic increase in failing grades, how many of these students earned multiple Fs? Uh, are we looking at kids that that just uh, received a, a single F uh, or uh, to what degree are these kids uh, uh, receiving multiple failing grades at the high school? And then how does the intervention differ for the student who earned multiple Fs as compared to a student who earned, you know, one F or, or two Fs? Thank you, Mr. Kinnear. Actually, Dr. Lewis, would you be able to start off on a response? I can, thank you. Uh, Mr. Kinnear, to your first part, uh, I would have to get back to you with that information. I don't have that readily available this evening regarding multiple Fs, if that would be okay. That, that's fine. And, and then uh, the second part, uh, uh, Dr. Lewis, uh, is is there a, a different strategy that's being organized for kids who, who received multiple Fs uh, as, you know, three, four, five, or maybe even they failed all their courses versus, uh, versus uh, say, a ninth grader who just failed one? Absolutely. So, so first, that's where our counselors are, are so vital in what they do with our students. So what you typically would see is if a student had struggles first semester uh, in multiple courses, the counselors would work with a student to identify what they then could take as a credit recovery course second semester while they also were taking a full course load. And they would do that based on student strengths and what they believe the student would be successful with. And then they go through and create a plan into the summer uh, based again on the multiple pathways that I spoke of earlier, aligning that student with every possible pathway on that credit recovery back. So it will vary. And then it will also vary which pathway that they're in based on what their outcome of their, of their goals are. I'm, I'm sure you're, uh, you're well aware of, of this, but, uh, but I, I expect that, uh, that our interventions and, and our strategies are, are uh, to some degree are gonna be mul uh, multiple year strategies uh, because, because ninth graders who have done poorly 
uh, may have uh, a, a lot to uh, to accomplish over over the next three years. Um, I I appreciate. Uh, I look forward to the the March 18th meeting where we learn more about uh, the extended learning opportunities. Uh, that will be very. Uh, uh, that will be an exciting meeting um, for uh, for for all of us. Um, I guess I have one more uh, one more question, and that's uh, you know we've had 60% of the school year uh, already uh, completed. Uh, we've had time to determine the effectiveness of some of our current strategies, uh, like our tutoring program, um, et cetera, et cetera. What strategies do we continue, and what strategies do we stop, or what strategies are we going to do differently? I'll, uh, I'll start that response. Um, it's also part of our LCAP process. Uh, the teams right now are in the middle of doing that just right now. Uh, a lot of our actions in um, that are also in LCAP, but it is also in our LCP. Um, we're in the middle of assessing, looking at some of the data, connecting it to the research and what some of the feedback is, because we do meet with many stakeholder groups that we're getting um, and making that determination right now. So I anticipate some of that will come, much of that is coming back um, through the LCAP process. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Trustee Kinnear, Principal Kinnear, very insightful questions. Uh, Trustee Dr. Farouk. Thank you, President Hunt. And I'll, I'll be very brief, I just have one, broad question. I, I think it's really impressive, um, the, just the comprehensiveness, the, um, the, the depth of everything that you guys are, the staff and team are doing is it's really remarkable. My only question is, is um, from your perspectives, I know that you touched a lot on how you're going to address barriers for families and students and you know the different people you're trying to serve. What do you think are going to be the most significant ways to uh, for us to actually be able to address um, just having a, a proper assessment of where the students are even at. I know that, that we're obviously gonna do that with the things that were described, but in terms of actually doing it um, effectively, right? Um, how, what are gonna be the challenges to doing that and how, to, how we intend to overcome them as well as on the implementation side, um, you know, same kind of situation of, of what the challenges are uh, that we anticipate to following through this efforts and what what could the board potentially do? I know we have, we're gonna go through the LCAP plan and I, I know you showed the time frame, but I mean more from a, a big picture standpoint, like if there's certain stakeholders, you, you mentioned a lot of different groups that you're partnering with, are there some areas of gaps where some of our relationships as board members, we could maybe help facilitate to shore these things up. That's the nature of my question. Uh, no, thank you. Um, if actually we take it kind of two parts, I think the first question, if we can, uh, I'll ask Dr. Sosa and Mrs. Reno Frasso to speak about the screeners and the type of um, data that we'll be receiving. And then I'll follow up with the second part of your question really around some of the community partners. Sure, thank you, Dr. Perez, and thank you for your question, Dr. Farouk. Uh, yes, this is a this is a big effort to reboot, so to speak, a universal screening in a di in a district our size. But it is absolutely necessary and urgent. And so, part of our planning process with our um, adoption team, once we get the team to a place where they make a recommendation, will be to leverage their strengths to work on implementation from the beginning and think about how we're going to be supporting teachers with proper training and then uh, perhaps coaching and support systems um, going along the way as we're learning this new skill to be able to use that information then to uh, change student outcomes. Mrs. Reno Frosto, did you have anything that you'd like to add to that? I think the only other piece and want to give a, a huge thank you to our adoption team who have just been amazing at bringing the perspectives of teachers in all programs um, and all uh, stakeholders in terms of students and our families and the, and the guiding principals. They've been amazing with that. 
And I think one of the challenges is just making sure that what, um, as we select that it can be implemented in various environments, including a remote environment, an in-person environment, and accessible to all. Thank you. I'll just respond. Thank you, um, Mrs. Reno Froster and Dr. Sosa. Um, just wanted to address that um, last component, uh, Dr. Farouk. Um, I think there's a, a few ways that we're trying to get a cross section. One is really leveraging and using the um, strength of our partnerships with our parent associations. Uh, we're working all very collaboratively together um, and communication is going to be key. One, communicating those results, what's happening in the classroom from a teacher and student perspective, but also getting the perspective from families and making sure there is is clarity as to how families can support in that way. So we have that family piece, but also it, it's going to be that community partner. So we can, um, that's a great discussion point for the entire city and community, especially as we open to really um, strengthen those partnerships because our families are experiencing lots of different types of trauma that will need various partners mm -hmm. to be able to address those different things for our different communities all over Riverside. Thank you. It's it's such a, a um, just a, such an ambitious challenge ahead, and and it's remarkable again how well all of you are organizing to to take this on in a, with sober reality. So thank you so much for your efforts. Thank you, Trustee Farouk. Do I have any other questions from my fellow board members? Okay, not at this time. I I have a few. Uh, just if I may. Uh, Dr. Perez, and I, I may have just missed this, but as we look at universal screeners, I, I, how are the English language learners, which is, this is so difficult, I mean, it's difficult for everyone, but tell me about how you're, you're gonna address that. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, Dr. Sosa, can you respond to that? <laughs> Yes, Dr. Perez, I'd, I'd actually be very excited to respond to that. Thank you, uh, Board Board President Hunter, for the question. Um, I was remiss, actually, in sharing a really important initiative that uh, is being led by the um, EL Services Department in conjunction with the Universal Screener. So not only will all English learners across the district have equal and equitable access to um, the screeners, but we will also be leading in our EL services team is leading an action team right now to adopt a, a specific assessment tool that will focus on language acquisition so that we can better monitor and then by way of using the data, have teachers support our students in acquiring English language as we go through. Uh, one that mirrors the state standards and that will give really critical feedback so that teachers can help students um, minute by minute, just as we, as we talk about within our guide for instructional direction. And that's really important and, and uh, foundational work that I forgot to mention. So thank you for thank reminding you. us. Thank, thank you, Dr. Perez. Uh, where do, um, is, is the funding for the CLEARS Act, is that part of the 42 million we received in CARES money or, or where's the funding for this? Wonderful program, but where's the funding? Um, because it'll live in a few different places, uh, it'll be CARES. We're also looking at LCAP um, because learning loss is a part of the learning continuity and attendance plan um, and also some title dollars. So um, as the plan gets a little bit more solid, um, so you can see all of the different pieces, we'll have the budget component uh, really clear as well. And one last question, and Dr. Sosa and referred to getting uh, professional development and help for our teachers. Um, we all know that too, that social, emotional, and, and uh, Dale Roberts is a good example of our classified staff and all that. What are we doing with them to uh, make sure they're, they're advancing as our team? Just, you know, we, we, all of them are educators. So just help me on that if you will. Thank you. No, that's a great point. Um, I was just seeing if someone was unmuting to respond. Um, oh. Where a lot of these opportunities um, are for all of our educators, especially if they're job specific. Um, a really good example is just last week, we opened up some modules available to all of our educators and all staff, uh, because when students walk onto campuses, every single staff member uh, can support students um, in the process. So we're looking at multiple ways for lots of different staff 
um, to be able to get the training that they need to support students and families. Thank you, that's great. I, I appreciate it. And uh, so now we're, we're gonna move to the next item. Uh, Ms. Frost, do you wanna uh, reach out to the folks in it for item L, uh, I2, excuse me, and just so we can uh, invite public comment, I appreciate it. Absolutely, thank you. We will now open the queue to provide public comment for item I2. If you are a member of the public who has joined the Zoom call this evening to comment on agenda item I2, an update on the attendance boundary committee's report, you may now enter the queue by using the raised hand function if you are logged in using the computer or star nine if you are using your phone to call in. Once again, the queue is only open for agenda item I2, an update on the attendance boundary committee's report. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Frost. And as she just uh, mentioned and Dr. Hansen talked about earlier, we'll be hearing ab about boundaries and uh, of course a very important uh, issue in, in any school district. And, uh, and it's been one of, for a long time, Mrs. Alavi and I would tell you particularly that uh, hasn't come before. So Dr. Uh, Hansen, please, please move forward on this and we look forward to your report. Thank you, President Hunt. It's actually going to be discussed with Sergio San Martin. He's uh, as one who's led the the attendance boundary committee, and so as they pull that up, I will uh, turn it over to you, Sister San Martin. Thank you, Dr. Hansen. Good evening, President Hunt, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Hansen. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present an update on the ongoing planning work of the Attendance Boundary Committee, including a summary of our district's enrollment trends. I will conclude this evening with the next steps in the planning process and input from our Board of Trustees. Next slide. The Attendance Boundary Committee was formed in accordance with Board Policy 5116A to consider redistricting based on school enrollment, fluctuations impacting size of facilities, articulation among grade levels, safety factors, ethnic composition, transportation. Other data to, uh, to, to consider included future development, transfer trends, new schools, program choice, enrollment, trends, and equity. Next slide, please. <clears throat> the last boundary adjustment took place back in 2016 between Harrison Elementary and Lake Matthew Elementary. Other adjustments happened back in 2009, 2007, and 2005 when new schools were, were developed. Uh, the ABC committee was formed back in, in 2018, 19 in the school year. Uh, the committee was tasked to assess existing attendance boundaries and determine if redistricting is necessary by reviewing school attendance boundaries, focusing on reducing or avoiding overcrowding, balancing enrollment, and maximizing the use of existing classroom capacity. Next slide, please. I would like to take the time now to thank the committee members representing business services, communications, instructional services, the operations division personnel, personnel and pupil services. Next slide. The committee looked at various data uh, throughout uh, the 18 months that um, uh, the committee was put was formed. Here's a list of different items that the committee looked at. Uh, the, co the committee reviewed enrollment trends, projected enrollments, school capacity, demographics of our students. Uh, and with our ge geographical information systems, we're also able to use data, analyze data like student density, spatial analysis. Uh, we've tracked residential development, student generation factors from new development, from commercial, industrial, and, and, re and residential. Uh, student safety transfer data, busing and walking distance, redistricting scenarios, school programs, study areas, and so forth. Next slide. During the, the meetings, uh, the committee was asked what, what impacts school enrollment? And um, we have seen three major um, or four major events during the last uh, 18 months or last two years in our district. The first one is continual enrollment, decline. Um, there's been uh, approvals of three new elementary schools, COVID, and now program choices also. Uh, the committee looked at those, those impacts or those events within the last two years, but also looked at the new housing development, uh, population growth, birth rates, and you have the list there of, things, of items that could potentially 
impact enrollment in our district. Next slide. The committee also looked at our, our existing attendance areas. Now, this is an example of our elementary and middle school attendance areas. The color coded uh, map is the attendance areas for elementary. The red boundaries is the attendance areas for middle schools. The attendance areas for high schools are not shown here, otherwise it, it would have been too much information, but this is as an example, data from our GIS or geographical information mapping system. And this is an example, you, you see a blow up on the right side of the screen of an area of our district. This is uh, the east side neighborhood. And you can see that there's, there's um, color areas. Uh, for example, students that live within the orange area, which is assigned to Taft, students will be bus to, in this case, bus to uh, Taft Elementary or assigned to Taft. Um, there's two schools that serve this area, Longfellow and Emerson. The rest of the schools are over 2.5 uh, miles away from, from uh, the place of residence of our students. So this requires us to bus our students. You can see that our students in this specific area, they're being bused to Taft, Pachapa, Castleview, Magnolia, and uh, in some cases, uh, Alcott also. Next slide. The committee also looked at, uh, with our GIS system, a more deeper uh, detail of our uh, attendance areas. Our, all of our attendance areas are broken down into study areas or grid codes. And what that gives us, gives us the ability to look at specific areas more on a spatial analysis, more detail. For example, you have a, a section here of our color-coded attendance areas and then broken down uh, much detail of our study areas and then you have our spreadsheet here that shows, for example, grid code or study area 199B. Uh, when we look at that specific grid code or study area, it gives us attributes of our students, our place of residence, their address, programs that the students attend, uh, <clears throat> if they're being bused, and, and other, other attributes that could be uh, assigned to that specific grid code. In this case, a grid code 199B in, uh, includes 261 elementary students, 94 middle grade students, 229 high school students, a total of 584 students that live just within that study area. And this is important because as we, as the committee uh, looks at or analyzes potential areas to redistrict or a uh, boundary adjust, uh, we, uh, we take it down to the level of a study area and we know who would be affected, the impacts of that specific grade code by grade level or even by student. Next, next slide. The committee also looked at, uh, as we looked with, as we did use our, our existing student data, our creating student density maps. And this is, this is just more to look at where is the, our highest densities in terms of uh, students that live, uh, our highest students that live within a, an acre. And in this case, the darker the area, the highest density in that spatial area of, of, mm -hmm. the, of that area of town. For example, you have here uh, an example that is very uh, dark or red, that is the east side community. And this is a fully built out community that is very dense. And this just shows that there's a lot of students living there uh, much closer within an acre of space there. Mm -hmm. Next slide. Part of our GIS system is also to track development, and not only commercial, industrial, but also residential. And residential is important for us as we analyze it because it really it gives us a, um, an, an overlook of potential students, uh, student growth or students being generated from new development. In this case, this is an example here on the slide of Spring Mountain Ranch, uh, of just uh, an area of that development. And then you have the attributes table next, next to it on this slide, which gives us the type of development, if it, if it falls within the city or county, the number of, of, of uh, units that are being proposed or being built or built out at that time, if it's say Melarus or a community facilities district uh, and so forth. And uh, so it just gives a lot of data for us to look at as we uh, look at projecting students within the next uh, year or even the next five years. Next slide. 
This next slide, um, this is just a quick overview of our enrollment trends broken down by elementary, middle, and high school. And this, this here, as you can see, um, and this goes back from uh, 15, 16 school year all the way to last year in 1920. I'm not showing the 2021 school year, which is the current year, but I'll talk a little bit about that. But you can see here that last year we declined in elementary by 283 students coming into that year. The prior year coming into the 1819 school year, we declined by 428 students and 1718, we declined by 312. Now for this year, and the data is being cleaned up um, where there's, there's this year was more of an anomaly um, in terms of students being, you know, working from, from home and so forth. But the preliminary numbers are showing that going, coming into this year in October, the decline has been closer to a thousand students. And you can see that's a big drastic change. And those are, there are reasons for that too. For middle schools coming into this year, um, there was a decline, not as much, but uh, about 65 plus students. Last year, we declined by 24 students. And there's has been growth there in from 17, 18 and 18, 19. And there before that 15, 16, 16, 17, there was some decline there. <clears throat> for high school students, Coming into this year, surprisingly, there was a growth, a growth of three, about 300 students, uh, give a few t uh, up or down 300 students. Last year, coming into that year of 1920, there was a decline of 129 students. Coming into 1819, there was a decline of 302. And you can see that there's been consistent decline for high school students. And again, coming into this year was surprising that there was a growth of 300 students. And that could be also multiple reasons of why, why that uh, anomaly for this specific year. Next slide. Mm -hmm. When we look at the last year enrollment trends, we can see that within the last seven years, and this is total district total numbers, it includes this year's numbers. So you can see that in the last seven years, we've declined 2,853 students. Now this year is showing that we declined 764. Um, that is still be a data that still is currently being cleaned up, but this is very close to uh, what we've been experiencing this October. Last year in total, we declined 435 students. 2018, we declined 410. 2017, 531. And you can see that there's been consistent decline um, uh, beginning. Uh, 2014. Now we're not the only the only district uh, experiencing this. There are many districts in our in our county and in our state that have been experiencing this type of decline. In some cases, uh, a larger decline, and in some cases, less decline. But um, there there's been consistent decline throughout the state. We are working with our consultants uh, uh, who specialize in, in demography and projections. Um, we would update the board at a later date on their findings, um, but they're helping us district-wide to really look at um, the next five years and how does that going to look for us in terms of uh, growth or decline. <clears throat> Let's see, next slide, please. All right, the committee also looked at more specifically on uh, the different grade levels, and this is an area for elementary. Next slide. Okay, you can see here, we have a list of schools, schools that were analyzed, and then you have a section here where under data triggered and reviewed. And this is a list of one through 10, and there were some others, but these were the, the major ones that kind of rose to the top in terms of concerns um, that trigger, triggered uh, us to look at these specific schools more, more closely. Now, again, when this committee was formed uh, almost two years ago, major things have happened that, that have increased or um, raised the concern of some of these schools. <clears throat> For example, school capacity, enrollment, some schools that have enrollment over 800 students or schools that have enrollment under 500 students, uh, transfer requests for specific schools, uh, programs uh, for, uh, for um, specific schools, uh, growth in terms of residential or decline in, in, in developments in some, some areas, uh, number of portables at some schools, and future new schools that are coming that would also impact or be, would be a domino effect on schools that are currently serving uh, areas where we're looking at adding new schools. 
uh, modernization schedules and busing. Now, you can see the list of schools, for example, Alcott. Um, this is a school that has ES on, on it. Uh, this is a school that serves the East Side uh, community or the East Side neighborhood, as well as uh, Castleview and Emerson, <clears throat> Longfellow, Pachapa, Taft. Then we have the schools that serve the Spring Mountain Ranch or the high growth community. And that's where a future school, there's a lot of development taking place that has potential for a new school there in the future. Schools that serve that community are uh, like Fremont, they have the SMR, High Grove, um, that are currently serving that community. And then we have Casablanca, uh, schools that are currently serving that community. We have Harrison Elementary, Jefferson, uh, Madison, Monroe, Victoria, and Washington. So these are schools that uh, when the committee was looking at this in, uh, within that time frame, these schools st started to uh, come up as uh, these schools have been approved in, within the last uh, uh, two years in terms of progress being done and moving forward with those projects. Um, the committee has recommended that we know that these schools are going to come in, in the future. Uh, and the recommendation is just to postpone redistricting until the new schools are developed and also to take a closer look at the transfer process. Now, to give you um, an idea of, for example, the Casablanca, what is the timeline of Casablanca? Ideally, if moving quickly and diligently, uh, we can see a school opening up uh, in the 24, uh, 25 school year or even sooner. Um, now, we're not gonna start the redistricting or forming that boundary for that school at that time. We're gonna work backwards. Perhaps we can even start sooner in, in forming that attendance area for, for that new elementary, which could start 20, the 21, 22 school year and, and even going all the way to the 22, 23 school year. And that is important because um, the committee would continue to assess um, these schools in the case of Casablanca, there are many schools that serve that community, and it will be a domino effect as we start forming the attendance area for Casablanca. We have to look at the schools that serve Casablanca and balance their enrollment with neighboring uh, schools that serve that community. Uh, Dr. Farouk, do you have a question? Yes, um, I'm really glad that we're being very intentional about putting the busing as a trigger uh, and review process for the elementary school um, attendance areas and so forth. My only question is, what exactly do you mean by take a closer look at the transfer process? Can you elaborate what you mean by that? Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, for example, we have um, uh, Franklin Elementary. Um, they offer a specific program. They're like core, core knowledge, I believe, or other schools that offer DLI. Um, core knowledge is handled by transfers. And um, if that school, Franklin, in fact, it was one of those schools that it is very, it's getting very close to its capacity, its physical capacity. So one of the things that we can do is monitor that transfer and control that, the, the capacity of that school through our transfer process. We're not gonna transfer more kids into that school that the school cannot handle. So that's, that's kind of what I was, uh, um, that the committee looked at in terms of uh, looking at a transfer process and having a little more control to manage our capacities of our schools. Understood, thank you. Thank you. Uh, next slide, please. The committee also looked at middle schools and middle schools, next slide. There were several schools that, we, that uh, the committee um, has been paying attention or, or taking a look at. But one area that was interesting that the committee came across is an area that is called the tri-boundary area. And this is an area that was, or that was formed or implemented in, in the mid 20s, uh, 2000s. And this area serves Cage, uh, Gage Middle School, Sierra Middle School and Shamawa. Um, you can see that this area really is the Casablanca neighborhood. It's uh, bounded by uh, Jefferson Street, Victoria and Washington. This is really the heart of the Casablanca neighborhood. Currently there's 185 students, middle grade students that live here. Uh, 59 students as a snapshot uh, from the data, uh, 59 students attend uh, Shimawa, 76 are attending Gage, and 50 are attending Sierra Middle School. Now, when this was formed um, back in uh, 2000, um, this was part of the Gage Middle School. And at that time, perhaps middle, Gage Middle didn't have the capacity to, to receive the 185 students at that time, for example. So the, what 
students, what has been uh, more of a practice is that students that live within this area, they have the choice to attend uh, any of these three schools. Again, Chamawa, Gage, or Sierra. Uh, the committee looked at this area and uh, is recommending that there's at this point, no action should be taken um, and re regroup and revisit this area when we start uh, looking at uh, the, the Casablanca tennis area. At that time with the elementary, we should also revisit and look at the middle school attendance area for that specific um, region. Next slide. The other, the other uh, three middle schools that we looked at is Central Middle, uh, Franklin Augustus Mill, Mill, Miller Middle School and, and Uni Middle. Uh, Central Middle School, and you can see the areas or the data that was triggered in terms of looking at these, these sites. And for example, Central Middle School, their enrollment is under 650 students. Uh, Miller School, their enrollment, or they're in an area where there's growth and continuing, there's a lot of development taking place and, and there's there's been consistent growth there. And we're just gonna monitor, continue to monitor that school um, and uh, watch, watch it very closely, make sure that we don't get to the level of uh, to uh, its capacity. Uni Middle School is in a school that serves the Spring Mountain Ranch with the High Grove community. We wanna take a, uh, uh, continue to monitor uh, this school. And then this, the three schools that we talked about that are within the, the tri-boundary areas. The committee looked at this area, these, these schools, and are uh, recommending to, uh, at this point, uh, no action uh, of uh, redistricting or boundary adjustments, but continue monitoring. And then, uh, as we mentioned earlier, the tri-boundary area to redistrict when the new school, specifically Casablanca, comes on board. Uh, next slide. Uh, next slide, please. And this is the high school section. Um, the committee looked at the high schools, and as, as we uh, mentioned earlier, high schools have been declining uh, consistently within the last five years, uh, except for this year. And, and again, that's an anomaly year. But um, in terms of immediate redistricting or boundary adjustments, in terms of, of uh, capacity-wise, uh, we're not there yet. The committee uh, is not recommending to continue or to look at redistricting at the high schools. However, there was an area, there's an existing area called the dual boundary area that uh, there was uh, attention paid, uh, more of attention was paid to this area specifically because it's an area that is shared by Arlington High School and King High School. And you can see there um, uh, in that uh, hatched area below that this area is uh, within the, the Lake Matthew community. There's a lot of open space, still land that needs to be developed, but then there's a section that is fully developed. And that's where the majority of our students live there. There's about 81 high school students that live there. Uh, out of the 81 students, 67 um, have chosen to attend King High School and 14 have um, elected to attend Arlington High School. And the reasons for that, as the committee looked at more spatial wise, you can see that uh, King High School is much closer distance wise to the, the dual boundary. And when you look at, um, and these are the red dots in, in, the, in the map, you can see that further up on the, on the slide is Arlington High School. And that is quite a way up, uh, up there. Um, the committee looked at this and uh, we've been uh, leading in terms of, uh, of our three new elementary schools that are coming on board in, in, the, in, in the future. So th those are the three major areas that, uh, that really uh, impact how we move forward in terms of redistricting or boundary adjustments. The recommendation of the committee is to regroup, reassess, continue looking at um, uh, reviewing our enrollment trends and our projections, working with our consultants. Um, looking at space utilization through post COVID and how does that changes in terms of of program choices, my students being um, uh, choosing to stay at home in terms of home base or virtual learning. Um, and then redistricting as new schools are developed using the committee to continue looking at those new schools that are coming on board as, uh, as a committee to develop that attendance area for those specific schools. And then look and take advantage of um, reducing busing when possible. And, uh, and as, as more students are our, um, well, first, as, as students are, as our enrollment declines, and if our students' program choice is virtual learning, there's a possibility, for example, at uh, in the east side neighborhood of Longfellow and Emerson having more seats available to 
to uh, pick up some of our students that are currently being bused in that area. So those are some opportunities that the committee, the committee would like to continue to, to assess and review as we continue with ending this school year and also moving to the next school year. Um, I believe Mr. Mr. Lee, you have a question? Yes, thank you, Mr. San Martin, and to your committee for, for these, this work and this recommendation. Um, I know you said that one of the one of the triggers that we looked at was this declining enrollment. Um, but and I know you said that there are some demographers that are working on um, you know future analysis on on trends in that regard. But weren't most of these, with the exception of the COVID-related decline, um, predicted in terms of declining enrollment? We anticipated these declines at, at many of our school sites. That, yes, uh, Mr. Lee, we have been tracking um, based on our historical enrollment, enrollment trends. Um, part of it, how we internally look at projections, looking at the county uh, in terms of birth rates, and uh, even though our, in terms of population, there's been growth in our county, but there's been a decline in birth rates and students um, in, in our areas. That has uh, a raise of uh, concern, not a concern, but looking at as we as we plan for future uh, uh, school years, that there will be a continuum of decline. And that's that's one of the reasons we we reached out to the experts in in, in uh, demographers, and that this is what they do. Um, they have a larger area to look at uh, and more data to really analyze, to check and balance uh, our data internally. Uh, but we have seen uh, decline. There, unfortunately, there hasn't been a pattern. There's ups and downs. Um, you know, middle schools have at one point were declining. Now they're 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 we're balancing out. In some some years, we're growing, and it, we're, that's part of kind of the bubble that was going through those years. But, um, but yes. And I do, I realize I do have more questions, but I realize we haven't done public input on this topic. So, um, Mr. Hanna, I'm sorry, uh, but I'll turn it back over to you so you can get through that part. Mr. San Martin, Assistant Superintendent, thank you for that report. Is that concluded? I, I already missed it. Yes, that concludes the presentation. Thank you, and uh, thank you, your committee. Uh, Ms. Frosto, I, I believe we have a public comment. Would you uh, please move forward with it? Yes, thank we you. do. Thank you. Mr. Jason Hunter, you may go ahead and unmute. You have three minutes. Well, de facto result of three elementary schools, of course, is redistricting. These three new elementary schools are currently proposed to be paid for under Measure O funds in the face of ongoing decade-long enrollment declines. That alone is questionable policy decision I will speak to another day, perhaps. Uh, these three schools were added to the Measure O project list after Measure O was passed by the voters in 2016. Uh, they weren't just added to the Measure O project list, they were also put to the very top of that project list, which I can prove through the district's own documents. Uh, for folks who are not familiar, my name is Jason Hunter. I, serve on the, I served on the state man mandated Measure O oversight committee until I was retaliated against and kicked off by our USD staff, including the Superintendent Hansen, Chief Business Officer Mays Kakish, and Assistant CBO Sergio San Martin. Uh, with the consent of certain board members for pointing out these inconvenient truths. You see, there is no independent oversight of your money folks out there who are listening, only the illusion of such at RUSD, but I digress. Which of course means uh, getting back to the redistricting enhanced by the statewide school bond failure this past March, that many schools with dilapidated facilities within the district will not get the necessary fixes as were provided ours were promised to this community and the board knows this. And as the around the clock news cycle that was COVID-19 recedes, which is my prediction, the community will become better educated as to how this board baited and switched and continues to misappropriate our money. If the board actually cared about this community, it would realize how short-sighted this strategy was. You see the integ integrity and credibility matters. And it is well known our USD needs another bond you know, to fix our dilapidated schools, what you promised us back in 2016. But the dishonesty displayed by this board will ensure that that will not happen anytime soon. 
the board is choosing their personal agendas over the promises they made to this community. And that is unacceptable and it will not stand without repercussions. And so I don't plead, but I demand that the RUSD stop the bait and switch of Measure O and find alternative funding for these schools if it wants to build these schools, including maybe putting them on, heaven forbid, the next ballot measure. Measure O was to fix the existing schools. Let's get back to what the, uh, you promised the community you were going to do. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Hunter, for your insightful and uh, continuing uh, uh, debate on this. So, uh, Ms. Frost, do we have anyone else? Uh, call that, con that concludes public comments for this evening. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. I will close public comment, and I will now go to our trustees to see if, you know, and uh, a wonderful report, Mr. San Martin, but we have questions about, about the boundary uh, study. And I'm sorry we're missing you all earlier. I've got two screens to look at. So do I have any questions for my, my fellow trustees? All right. Oh, th thank you, um, Trustee Kinnear, please. There you go. Before I ask questions, Mr. Lee, uh, did we interrupt your questions? Should we go, should we go oh, back? Go, go ahead, Mr. Kinnear, I'll, I'll proceed after you. I, I have a, a couple of comments and uh, and a few questions. I think we should take a look at the composition of the attendance boundary committee. It, it appears that we don't have representation from principals, teachers, parents, or community organizations on that very important committee. All of these groups will bring a perspective which will allow us as a board to make better decisions in the in the future. Uh, Second thing, I, I, uh, I appreciate uh, uh, being refreshed on board policy uh, consider, uh, requiring considerations for redistrict, redistricting. RUSD values equity. Uh, perhaps we could consider the role of Dr. Perez and the Community Equity Task Force in the process of determining boundary changes. That might be very helpful for us. Now to a couple of my questions. At the high school level, it appears the committee only analyzed the dual boundary area of MLK and Arlington. How do we determine the scope of the committee's work? Mr. San Martin. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Kinnear. Can you elaborate a little bit more on the, what do you mean by the scope of work? Um, well, let me understand your question a little bit better. Well, uh, the the committee the committee looked at uh, at, at the high school looked looked uh, looked at just MLK in Arlington. Uh, why didn't they look at uh, at other high schools? Why did why didn't they look at uh, at what's happening um, uh, you know throughout the district with with uh, with with the schools? Oh, you know, great. specific example, I suppose. And maybe it's not a good one, but uh, one that comes to one that comes to mind is that uh, that uh, Martin Luther King High School is uh, is uh, our largest school, and we're uh, we're looking at at spending money to add to their parking lots and do other things. Uh, but it doesn't appear that the, this was in the scope of the committee to uh, to to look at issues that are affecting uh, other things besides that. Uh, dual boundary area. Sure. Uh, thank you. Um, the committee did look at various data, specifically the, in, in terms of prioritization was schools that were getting close to overcrowding or lack of classroom space in terms of capacity. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there's been consistent decline within the last five years in our high school grades. When the committee looked at the data, there, was, there wasn't any red flags in terms of lack of capacity that, were, um, that we needed to immediately look at redistricting high schools. Now, um, separate from that, uh, the committee did look at various, various data. Our focus was on not only TK through 12, but uh, the, one, the areas in, for high schools that, that were, um, were of a concern was that dual boundary. Uh, part of it was looking at an opportunity to to balance the enrollment at Arlington. That was an area that is being shared by King. However, because of the distances and uh, we are a school of choice, um, that uh, the committee felt that at this time it would be 
uh, appropriate to just leave, that, leave it as is for now, but continue monitoring should the enrollment at our high schools uh, start picking up at a future date. From Satin, next question, from the, from the data presented in your slides uh, depicting historical enrollment trends, you know, it's clear that we've lost uh, over 2,800 students uh, over the course of the last seven years. Uh, what we don't have is the information garnered from that historical data, which allows us to predict future numbers. Uh, uh, obviously, we have a projection for next school year. What is the projection for next school year? Do we have a loss for next school year? Um, I can probably jump and answer this question. Um, we do have uh, an anticipated decline for next year. Most of our decline is not necessarily just losing students from our district. That is one factor, but it's the lower birth rates that we are experiencing. That's why there's a bubble that's going through the years. Um, there is also the, um, the affordability of being in Riverside versus other surrounding areas that are more affordable for families. So when families starts to grow, they look for affordable housing if they wanted to acquire housing. And so they've been moving to surrounding areas. So there's several factors that we looked into, but what we did because of what we've experienced as a higher decline during COVID, um, we've experienced almost double what we've projected because of COVID. But that's what happened across the state too um, in other in districts. Um, we've hired a consultant. We've, we do our own projections. We have expert staffs that have worked at the cities and that um, worked with our developers um, and they've predicted and issued a report for enrollment projections for the next five years. But in order to be more assured of our numbers, we've hired a consultants that are expert in that area and they look at a much more detailed and in-depth demographics and they are done with the report. The report will be presented to our finance committee next week. Um, it'll, be it'll be presented by our consultant at a much more detailed level. And then we will take um, the direction to how we move forward for the full board in a study session or in a future board meeting. Um, but we are looking at a decline throughout the next five years. Um, and then we look like we would stabilize eventually. So um, I, I think we can give you a lot better answer question, to your question after that finance committee. Okay, I, I think that the, the answers to, to that question are, are, are seriously important to us, knowing the, the projections obviously for next year is, is, is immediate. And then knowing the projections for the next five years uh, is, uh, is, uh, is equally important. Um, and to know those numbers by level, um, uh, by elementary, middle school, and, uh, and high school. So I look forward to, uh, uh, to, to hearing that information and trying to, uh, to, to understand it. You know, at this very moment, uh, you know, we're proceeding with, with plans to build four new schools uh, when we're experiencing that significant enrollment decline and that enrollment decline is gonna continue for probably another five years, which we'll hear about more later. Uh, I think I have the rationale as to, as to why we're doing that. Uh, you know, Casablanca and Eastside students have been bused outside of their neighborhoods for decades. Uh, I understand that and we wanna correct that. Uh, we're experiencing growth in the high grove area. So we're planning to build Spring Mountain Elementary uh, we have a current STEM program at, at uh, uh, high school at the elementary site, and we're proposing to build a new high school at UCR so we can expand the enrollment uh, at that school to 800 students or, fifth, or 1,200 students. I'm not, I'm not sure which. You know, some of these things I, I uh, agree with, and some of them I don't. Uh, nonetheless, I'm missing the piece about what our USD looks like when we build these schools in declining enrollment. Uh, I understand and support the recommendation that we don't take action now to redistrict. Uh, that, makes, that makes sense to me. However, I would like to see potential projections, including demographics, 
as a result of our investments in, uh, in building these new schools and making these changes. If, if I may add, Mr. Kinnear, that um, there's other factors that went into place as we were planning the future elementary schools, specifically those three that are um, projected. Some of the information that we've studied is how to offset, you know, um, I just wanna back up a little bit and say that in a declining enrollment status, um, district look at balancing the whole district from a lot of different aspects. So to, to create equity, to make sure that we are addressing some of the needs in our district, in particular in Riverside, we have bused our students from two different areas in our district um, up to an hour and a half on the bus for years. And so that was one factor that we looked at for an equity purpose to create the same learning environment for our students. It, we believe at the team that, that moved this recommendation forward felt like that was not equity for students to create the same learning environment, to be on the bus in the morning and in the afternoon for that long. And for the parents and the parent community in those, in those areas, it also did not give an opportunity for the parents to participate in their neighborhood school activities. And so that was one factor. There was several factors, but that was one factor. When we looked at the cost of the busing, it was very much aligned with the cost of an operation of a, an elementary school. And so for a district budget, usually it doesn't make sense to keep schools open or build schools in a declining enrollment um, environment. But because we're spending a lot of our dollars, I'm saying millions of dollars on busing, um, and because we are able to create some equity within our uh, boundaries of our district, those two weigh very heavily on us moving those particular schools forward for a recommendation. Of course, this is a living uh, decision that we have to continue to evaluate until you actually approve the project at one point and send it for construction. You continue to reevaluate and you continue to see if those factors are still relevant. I believe the two factors for the busing are definitely relevant. The no. factor for um, the High Grove area and the Spring Ma Mountain Ranch um, community and the growth that came and continues to be developed in that area is also a high factor. So when you look at that and having elementary schools that are way over the number of students in that school that we can say that it's a good environment for the students and to balance that down, like some, some of the schools that are over a thousand, redistricting those schools as we planned the new schools made sense at the time. Now, I know this year is an anomaly and double the decline is not comfortable for all of us. That's why we engaged in this report and we hope to get some direction from the board eventually to whether or not these decisions and the factors that we took in consideration as we brought them forward to the board are still valid and still uh, a priority. So all of that, I, I believe, is still coming to the full board as they look at the projections and where they will take us and whether or not we can continue with some of those factors. Now, one of the things that this district has always believed in is smaller schools environment, but there is a balance to what how small a school could be. There's also the choice uh, factor that we wanted to accomplish within our schools and our programs and we wanted to create specialty schools within our district, whether it's STEM, whether it's school that would, would specialize in the arts programs. Having to redistrict and made, make some schools available to, re, uh, to be reallocated for those specialty programs was also another factor that our team had looked at that we can be innovative and creative in making sure that we balance the schools as we build new schools um, and take advantage of um, of this environment. So when you build a school, you're spending one-time monies. And when you're um, creating the options, you're actually attracting our own community to stay within our district and possibly uh, attracting other families to come into our district because of our district programs and the choices that we would create. All of that was studied at the time, um, but there's also opportunity to re-examine uh, all of these factors and make decisions as we go along. Yeah, maybe I, I wasn't clear in uh, my statement and uh, 
and uh, and and my desire. Uh, I'm fully aware of uh, of uh, of the the number of years Casablanca and the East Side School have been interested in a neighborhood school, uh, and I fully support that a hundred percent. I mean, that was uh, an, an East Side School and a Casablanca School was uh, was was in people's dreams and thoughts uh, years. Years and years and years ago, uh, uh, even even when I was beginning in uh, in uh, in this school district, uh, that's that's not that's not my point. My my point is I would like to see uh, so, so, uh, a look at at what the numbers uh, might uh, might be when those schools open. I want those schools. I, that's that's not that's not what I uh, that, that's not what I was insinuating. What I want what I want to get a picture of, which I I don't have, is you know what does Washington look like? What does Taft look like? Uh, what you know what do what is the the schools that heavily feed uh, um, the Casablanca area and the East Side area? Uh, look like in terms of numbers, in terms of demographics, in 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 terms of program, um, et, et cetera, et cetera. It's not that I don't want those new schools to be built in the East Side in Casablanca. I do. Well, that's that's not my point. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Kinnear. We, we we can provide that information. We've looked at it in the past, and so we can revisit and circle back. Uh, to the, uh, as we build, for example, Casablanca, what happens to the seven surrounding schools that currently those kids come to? That's information we've provided in the past. We can recycle that uh, absolutely and and see how that ch has changed now with some decline enrollment in that area and throughout the district. So thank, thank you. you. That, that's all I'm asking. Thank you. And and Dr. Hanson, when you when you do that, you'll force copy of those insightful questions from Trustee Kinnear. Uh Trustee Farouk. Um, I think it generally was covered. Uh, I was just going to echo what Dr. Hansen said that um, the, the, the four of us had been given that specific information when we were making those earlier decisions. And so I, I think it'll be instructive for you to have that also, yes. Trustee Premier. And, yes. and I, I really appreciate, even though it might not have directly addressed your questions, just the comprehensive way that Ms. Kakish addressed those points. And I, the two, one point I just want to emphasize that she briefly brought up is that smaller class sizes broadly from a district standpoint is, is going to enhance more um, student engagement and, and lear, uh, learning opportunities. Um, and the, the last thing I'll say that maybe I didn't hear Ms. Kakish mention is that just because we're having declining enrollment doesn't mean that it's evenly being distributed throughout all 50 schools. Okay. And so th there's still a component of like, obviously like we're talking about Spring Mountain Ranch area where there's growth we have to be mindful that it, 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 that in and of itself is, does not preclude even absent the aspect of smaller class sizes, a need to potentially ha um, you know, have um, additional school construction. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Farouk. Do I have any other questions for my trustees? Oh. I, I want to just add one yes, more. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Is one of the piece that was so creative and innovative is also... Uh, talking about the the structure of those new schools could be different in RUSD. Besides the specialty schools, we could be looking at different components of K-8 type of um, schools that could accommodate um, the community and the district overall. Um, all of that is being studied also uh, through our ed services programs and seeing how we can be innovative with providing the choices and the specialty schools at the same time. And so when you brought up Spring Mountain Ranch, it, it, it was one of the ones that was discussed and uh, possibly looked at for a K-8 program in the future. I mean, you can do things in phases as you build a school, you can build an elementary school knowing that you would create a K-8 eventually and get that community served that way because we, as uh, Mr. San Martin Martin has mentioned, we do have a bubble in the middle school and we have growth in the middle school versus the elementary schools. And so we wanna be able to address that too at the same time. Thank, thank you, Ms. Uh, that's our chief business officer, uh, Ms. Keish, please. Um, uh, Trustee Lee, you had a question, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you. I mean, I'm, uh, I'm pleased to have these conversations, uh, especially as we have a new trustee to make sure that 
that he has the information he needs to help make better informed decisions. Because um, as Ms. Kakish said, you know, this is a this is a fluid environment that we're in. And while we have these plans based upon information that we had at the time, you know, it's entirely possible that things change and we make decisions different. Um, so I'm glad that we're looking at these things. Uh, I don't recall a time, at least since I've been on the board, that I, I really re remember talking about this attendance boundary committee. So I'm glad that this work has been going on the last couple of years and they're reporting back with these recommendations. Um, Mr. Kinnear did bring up a point that I, I would like some clarity on as it regards to board policy, um, I, would, I would imagine, about the committee's role and responsibility and who those committee members are. So is that, how, how is that determined about who serves on that committee? Um, if that, that's my first question. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Our, our board policy uh, explains when to look at it. When, when, when should the, uh, the district start looking at uh, boundary adjustments? It doesn't, I don't believe it specifies who needs to be represented. However, um, what this committee's purpose is to, at the level of, uh, of looking at data and warranting, bringing the recommendation to superintendent and to our board that we need to look at redistricting or making a recommendation. The next phase of actually looking at specific areas that we need to redistrict, that's when we bring the, the stakeholders that will be affected, the, the school principals that are in, that will be impacted, members of the community and so forth. And then there's a transition plan of how do we implement the, uh, the actual boundary or redistricting of these specific areas. That is a process that needs to take place. Um, and it's very important that we have a transition plan and not just uh, uh, do a change just for the next year because that, that could impact our students and their families. Um, but in terms of who needs to serve, we would bring this, we can, at the next level, we can bring it to the Operation Board Subcommittee and uh, work on who needs to be represented. Yeah, I think, I think that'd be good. I, I mean, I don't, I don't uh, dispute those that were participa participatory in this committee. I'm glad that they were. It seems like they were area experts. Um, and it sounds like there, if, if there were recommendations to start potentially making changes and starting to involve stakeholders at the community level and the site level, I think that'd be, be important. Um, and on, on that note, I think that brings me to my next question. Um, I think parents, you know, probably sometimes even before they have kids, they start determining on where they want to live because they think one school is going to be better for their kid than another. Um, and in, in my other, my other job, uh, these are conversations I have on a daily basis to try to help educate families that I, I get you really want to go to this school, but I promise you, even if you live over here, you're going to get a great experience at this school too. Um, but no matter how much uh, I educate or any of us educate families about that, uh, some still just say like, you know, I went to Arlington, so my kids going to Arlington. I went to Gage, so my kids going to Gage. Um, so I think if we know that we're going to be doing some redistricting in the near future, it would be wise to signal to families, I don't know how, that we are going to be looking at redistricting uh, as plans, at least as they currently are, are, are in the works, um, so that, that parents know, so that if they're going to make a big decision like purchasing a house, uh, and if one of their key factors in purchasing a house or renting a house for that matter uh, is to be in a neighborhood so their kid can go to a specific school, um, that they know that that, that, that that choice might change based upon conversations we're having right now. Um, so uh, I, I don't know how we can get that information out there that if, if the board, you know, we're not taking action on anything tonight, but if, if we're kind of nodding our heads that this is the recommendation that we're not going to make any decisions today or pursue this avenue at the moment, but in the very near future that we're going to start down this path again and convene this committee, um, that we make parents aware that it's likely that there's going to be changes to the boundaries soon. Um, because right now, I know I, I was part of a, a meeting this morning with an economist. I mean, I think even the, the, the demographic numbers that we saw just a few years ago, trying to guess on what our enrollment was going to be in, in different parts of the city, has changed drastically because of COVID. Um, 
you're starting to see urban flight. People are moving from, you know, the LA basin out towards the suburbs in, in, a, in a dramatic number in the last 12 months because uh, this work from home option is now becoming a reality for a lot of families and parents are realizing that, hey, I don't need to live in Pasadena, Altadena, Los Angeles for work anymore. And I can sell my house there or my, my little postage stamp house there, my apartment there and move to a house in Riverside, in Lake Elsinore, in somewhere out this way, inland, uh, which potentially could impact our numbers. Um, so I think you have that uh, also to consider. So um, I think my, my message today is somehow get the information out to families uh, that change is coming. And if that's important to them, then they should proceed with caution. Th thank you, Trustee Lee. I, Dr. Hansen, can you um, add, some, yeah, I know you had some items to add and I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hunt. And thank you, Mr. Lee for that insight. And you're right. Matter of fact, we asked that same question and just take, for example, Casablanca and uh, that school, if we move forward, which I believe we are moving forward, uh, that would ribbon cutting and talking to Sergio, the soonest would be 23, the latest 24. And so I said, okay, if that's the case, and here's 21, when would, when would we start these redistricting conversations for those schools? And even the stair steps up to middle school. And the answer that Sergio gave was this year in 21 and finish up. So uh, this, this school year, 21, 22. So we need to get the word out. I like the suggestion of expanding beyond staff to enjoy or to involve community, whether it's uh, something that Dr. Prez is involved in or people that are specific to that community. I just want to share that timing that very timely for this evening because redistrict conversations for that Casablanca area and then the three middle school, Shamal and Sierra and Gage, what happens early is uh, this coming fall and, and needn't be done by the end of next school year. So just wanted to share that. Thank you. Mrs. Allaby, I haven't talked to you yet. Do you have any questions or comments? I know this came before our committee operations and uh, as the board knows, I, as president, I've recommended the next operations committee be Mrs. Allaby and, and Mr. Kinnear. So that will be interesting. This is a fluid uh, uh, situation. I want to ask just a few questions. Thank you, Dr. Hanson, and for bringing up the equity and diversity. And as Dr. Farouk talked about, um, you know, class size makes a difference. But and as, as Ms. Kakish talked about, uh, the pain is not spread equally. Uh, if, if school were open this morning, we would have bust, uh, I, Ms. Kakish, I think at least 600 children from Casablanca and about double that plus it from the east side. Is that correct? Yes, right. close to 2,000 kids that are being bused. Right. So again, it's not equally distributed. What is our, uh, uh, our contractual relationship with the teachers and, and all it? For, isn't K3 is limited to 23 children? Is it 20? I don't remember. So class size, we do have a 24 to one in TK through three, but it's not just about the class size, it's about mm -hmm. the school size as a whole too. Right, well. And in the, uh, the administration and the proper staffing level at all levels for our students. Right. Well, you know, that, that's, and that leads to my next, uh, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, Riverside Polytechnic High School, which opened in 65, was built for 1600 students. We had class this morning, they'd be 25 to 26. Uh, Trustee Kinnear, serving a, a long time at North, uh, John W. North would also understand it was built for a much smaller population. So some of it has to do with, not blaming anyone, but, but a much smaller Riverside, that is Mr. Lee, who's in the real estate business, as, as explained, it's, we've grown. But I, leading to that, I, I want to uh, ask Mr. San Martin, what, uh, you know, the, the housing plan, the housing element plan that the state of California requires that our county and our city, and just to clarify, Riverside uh, Unified School District includes the city of Riverside, and, and part of it, we stop at Tyler, but we go up to Lake Matthews all the way out to, to High Grove, which let me add, that elementary school is not named Spring Mountain Ranch Elementary, it's yet to be decided. So, uh, but we have a housing element required by the state of California on the city of Riverside, which three years ago was to come up with 6,000 elements of dwelling units. Now they have to come up with 18,420. I don't know with the green belt, I'm not sure that's gonna happen. But Mr. San Martin, how much did this, and, and I don't know what the county's numbers are, and I should find out, 
how much did the housing element and what's going to occur there play into this? Because let me just add, we know that where we can grow, as you showed, is kind of that area behind Woodcrest up, up to uh, the Val Verde. And then of course, Lake Matthews and, and back this way, uh, east way, and, and has the Spring Mountain Ranch high growth areas. So um, how much did that factor into your committee's review on all of this? Thank you, Mr. Hunt, President Hunt. Yes, we, we monitor uh, development throughout, throughout our district, um, which is city and county. So we work with both um, city staff and county staff on their plans in terms of their housing element, uh, tentative track maps, and active uh, construction, uh, not only residential, but commercial industrial. Commercial industrial also produces or generates families moving into the city and there's a small generation factor, but um, specifically for new housing, uh, single family homes or even multifamily homes, as we are seeing that uh, trend in the, in the downtown area. Um, so we're keeping a very close eye on that type of development and, and future students that will be generated from these types of developments. Mm -hmm. Now, what our experts are telling us and what we're seeing in terms of a trend of new housing and how many students are being generated, that rate has declined also drastically. So in the past, we would, we would look and work with developers. If a developer was building 100 homes, we would know and expect how many new um, students will be generated mm -hmm. or families within the next three years, five years. That was a very easy mathematical calculation. Now what we're seeing is that new developments, less that, that generation factor or that rate is, has declined, is, is getting smaller and smaller. Now, this is also being confirmed by our demographers and our experts in that area and city staff. However, that could also change. It, it's cyclical, what we've seen in the past, in the last 20 years. Um, in Orange County, we saw that when they were building much, much smaller studios and homes, not thinking that families will be moving there. And look at that, that has also turned around and now there's been growth. So we're keeping that, uh, paying attention very close to our development. And, and, and I agree with you, you're exactly right in terms of the housing element, uh, Riverside, the, re the requirement of increasing the types of housing uh, for our, within our city and our, in our county. And that is important for us because as new families come in, there is a the potential of, of growth. If one student shows up for each new housing, that's a lot of students. Now, the reality is that that rate has declined tremendously, but we're keeping, a tr we're keeping track on that. And that comes into our calculation as we project with next year and in in, in within the next five years. There is our immediate projections, very uh, short term, but then also in our master plan, long-term planning, we consider those developments because in the next 10, 20 years, that calculation could change and we are always planning for the worst case scenario and the immediate needs also. Hopefully I, that helps. I, I, thank you very much. And I, I wanna assure everyone listening and, and my friend Dale Kinnear was very supportive of Measure O and, and which blatantly, and, and I was very involved in it, said, we're gonna build neighborhood schools. But I remember Ms. Kakish that when we talked about the busing from Casablanca, and, and we can, I should finish that, Dale Kinnear is very supportive and he works, he's worked very hard on the, on the east side before he got elected school. And so I want to compliment him on that. Uh, Ms. Keish, we talked about the busing from uh, 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 Casablanca. I believe we, we even figured out that, uh, and the busing money comes from our general fund, which takes away from, every, you know, it's classroom money. Whereas when we build a school, it comes from, uh, matching funds from the state and our bond money. But wasn't, if I recall, uh, that the Casablanca school would nearly pay for itself in 15, 16 years, just from the savings on the busing projecting increases too. That is true. We, we actually considered it almost a wash with the operational cost of that school, because mm. once you build an elementary school, you have to staff it for operation for a principal, assistant principal, the cafeteria staff, the custodial staff, um, campus supervisors. So it's almost like a wash and that's why it made sense to us to go ahead and recommend building a school because we are creating for the same cost to the general fund, a better learning environment for our students and a better hub for our families to have a neighborhood school. So it's not really, it wasn't about the savings, but it was more about how can we create a better learning environment 
without having it cost the district additional dollars. Um, uh, and I I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. A little bit about the report for enrollment projections that will be presented next week. It will be a public meeting. I think all of our board have access to, to view it um, and see the detailed report. As they go through the report, we've asked the consultant to also show all of the development areas. And in the actual live um, animation of that report, you'll be able to ask and say, can you zoom in on that development and tell me which developer is doing what and which side? Mm -hmm. And so you'll be able to see very detailed information about development um, that we've gathered through uh, that report. Right, and and we know that the Spring Spring Mountain Ranch area and the Lake Matthews area will, can accommodate single family homes, but a lot of the interior of Riverside is, is going to be multifamily housing, which uh, uh, if I remember Mr. San Martin, we didn't, for the, the ones that came downtown, uh, area we haven't really generated a lot of students out of out of those uh, new developments is that correct or can I clarify that that is correct and that's typical for that type of studio housing that uh, that was developed however as um, those types of housing uh, age um, there is a potential of, of growth that we there is the potential of seeing some families moving there in the future yes well thank you very much well, this is, uh, as Mr. Lee and my colleagues all said, this is a very important item. And uh, I remember when I first got on the board, Lou Vandersill, longtime board member, longtime, many times president of the board, uh, went to Palm School as a kid and principal at Central Middle School. And I think he hired David Hansen at the time, uh, told me that the things you got to be careful of, Tom, are the bees. And that's to uh, when you talk about boundaries or booster clubs. So uh, I remember that. But as, as Mr. Lee pointed out, this is very important. And uh, as far as, uh, people's perception of schools. Uh, and uh, I was so glad once when Andrew Walker called me, his, his son didn't feel as challenged as he should at La Sierra Academy, very, very bright young man. He wanted to see if I could get him into King, uh, Martin Luther King High School. And I said, you know, God can't get him into a King, it's over impacted, but recommended he went to Ramona, the young man looked at it, liked it, uh, graduated with honors and his fallback school was UCLA. So, uh, you know, I, I Arlington and, and Ramona are, are wonderful schools and all, as is the rest of them, and John W. North included. Um, all right, so uh, I think that's done. And, and uh, you know, Mrs. Alvey, perhaps if, if the board agrees to my committee assignments, this is something you'll continue to look at. I've asked you to be chair this year, so uh, and appreciate that. And thank you for your committee, uh, Mr. San Martin. Please express our, oh, this one. And thank you for your committee, Mr. San Martin. Please express our appreciation. Dr. Farouk, you had a question comment. I, just wanted to, I think Dr. Hansen was trying to say something. I'm, I'm, you know, I told you guys you got to wave or something because I'm looking at different screens and everything. No, thank you, Dr. Farouk. I'm good, Mr. Hunt. Okay. We All can right. wait for when we study this uh, as we tell more of the story, but it's been a great study session. I'm grateful to staff yes. for this one as well as the mitigating learning loss, those two topics this evening. So thank you, Mr. Hunt. Very, very good. All right. So, uh, we're gonna move on now to, uh, that was a very good report, thank you. And let's make sure that, as Mr. Lee pointed out, becomes more uh, public. If I have one other question, I apologize. Could you put up the elementary school screen you had that uh, I think it, it talked about some of our east side schools and all that, guys, I just had a question I wanna ask about that. That if I was at home looking at that, I'd, I'd wonder. But, um, Yes, yes. Mrs. Alvey's probably thinking I'm not going to make my promised nine o'clock agenda adjournment if I don't hurry up. Go ahead. If communications can help out, help bring up that slide, please. Oh, thank you, sir. Yes. Sergio, do you know which slide number it was? I believe it's slide eight. Slide, slide number, yeah. There yeah, okay. All right. So I wanted to ask you look at the, uh, you know, this reminds me when I was a my girls were very little. We had a map of America, had different colors. And my little daughter, Taylor, when we went to visit Arizona, couldn't understand why it wasn't pink. Um, when you look at the castle view uh, linear, and then we've got that little part of Pachapa in there. And the reason I bring this up is, uh, I remember it came up in Casablanca once because we have them going to different schools. And it's, you know, when you get home, you want to play with your buddies and across the street, he's going to X school and I'm going to Y. Uh, why, it, why does that exist that, that way, Mr. San Martin? Just that the chap is sort of bifurcated there and you have Emerson and Castleview bordering that little strip of the chapel. What, 
What is that about? Uh, Mr. Hunt, um, I don't have the history of uh, when these uh, tennis arrows were formed no. back many, many, many years ago. Um, in fact, if there, there's been some movement uh, several times within the last 20 years. Um, but th this is a good example of why uh, the importance of a committee to look, in, look at this area, specifically this area, and, and you pointed out why Pachapa breaks into two different areas. Uh, then you have and why does that break into different areas and it could be st student safety uh, uh mm -hmm. safety zones i mean i don't know this is something that the committee looked at and we walked the, com the, the community however the history in terms of uh when it was uh, formed um i think it'll need it that just poses the question of uh needing to take a closer look at uh of the the spatial area in this community well, that's why you want to think about the, uh, the operations committee. And I, I appreciate we can do that. This is uh, important. Uh, my, my best friend, you know, growing up out in La Sierra, lived about a mile up Cochrane, but, it, you know, we went to the same schools. And that's, that is important. It's about our socialization, which we're all missing right now. So thank you very much. And, and I think it, it, it would be proper to have the operations committee continue on, on this update. But I'll leave that to Mrs. Allaby and, and Mr. Kinnear. So uh, next is uh, finally J1, which is agenda items for future meetings. Do I, uh, any of the board members or would like to put anything on and, and Dr. Hanson and I and Mr. Lee will be getting together soon. So do we have any comments, questions, uh, suggestions for a future board meeting agenda items? All right, seeing none right now, I thank you. I do wanna remind you the next board meeting is on, on uh, uh, the 4th of March. And uh, at that time, we will be getting our second uh, interim financial report that will, uh, uh, and that will be published. And I'm glad to find out they will also include how the 42 million in CARES Act has been spent or will be spent. I know the county overspent theirs by, which is I think 112, they overspent it by 10 and they've got to figure it out. So I'm sure it was all put to good use. Um, tonight, I'm, I'm going to adjourn in, in, uh, on behalf of the board in recognition and honor of uh, a pl an employee that has been in my 13 years, uh, has done an ex exemplary job, but we're losing her. This is her last school board meeting with us because uh, Beaumont Unified, the one district that's growing in this county, uh, reached out and offered her the superintendency. So I wanna thank Mrs. Mays Kakish and uh, for what you've done, uh, you, you followed a, a fine CBO in, in Mike Fine, but the six years, and he set the foundation. Riverside Unified has always been fiscally responsible in its 140 years. And you have made, for this board member, I understand so much better the different colors of money, how it works. We're going to miss you. We're going to call on you, I'm sure. But uh, would any of the board like to say any comment is in, for Ms. Kakish? And I'll pick on Mrs. Allaby because I know, I know she's worked with her as long as I have. And, Thank you, Ms. Grant. I really would like to uh, to thank Mays for everything she's done. And um, you're right. The one thing that I appreciate so much uh, about Mays is the fact that she was able to um, come into the district, analyze things, and then um, explain things very clearly. And her transparency has always been one of her hallmarks. And I think that that's been wonderful. It's been wonderful for our relationships with our with our unions and uh, yes. it, it just goes to show uh, what exemplary character she has. And uh, I, I'm going to miss her very much. So I wish her good luck. Good luck in yeah. Beaumont. Yeah. Right. Uh, any other Dr. Farouk or yes, sir. Thank you, Dr. Farouk. Sure. I mean, I, I express my deep, uh, profound gratitude uh, to Ms. Kakish for her um, extraordinary service and leadership. Uh, shepherding us, you know, for all these years. I've been fortunate that um, the entire time that I've been on the board, she's been our chief business officer. So I'm very grateful for that. And uh, just really, you know, just wish uh, you well on your uh, next chapter of your career. It's obviously very well earned. And, um, and more than anything, I, I just value you as a, as a friend. So thank you again. Thanks, yes. Trustee Lee, Mr. Vice President. Yeah, um, yeah, we talk about being extraordinary in RUSD, and I think that that exemplifies what Mays brings to our district and what she has done for our district. And uh, we know that Beaumont is getting 
an extraordinary leader um, that that we're going to miss, and it's going to be very difficult to replace. Um, you know, I echo the sentiments of my colleagues that have been shared. Um, you know, you could always trust Mays. Period. Um, and I always appreciated her her candidness. Yes. She was never <laughs> shy to share no. her thoughts and her opinion. And uh, that's something that I always appreciate as a board member when I'm making decisions. We don't always have to agree, even though most of the time we did, but you know where Mays stand and she wasn't afraid to tell you if she disagreed with you. And I think that's important in the leadership uh, quality. So uh, congratulations again, Mays. Um, you, I, I almost forgot, I was looking at my calendar to see when our next board meeting was. And you know, I'm glad that Mr. Hunt mentioned that this is your last board meeting. And I'm sorry that we can't honor you in person with the, with the celebration, because that's what you're, you deserve. Um, but I look forward to continuing to connect with you. And, uh, and I'm sure that uh, the staff will, will lean on you for, for your advice as we transition uh, to the next person. But best of luck in Beaumont. And thank you for all you've done for our district and for your friendship. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. And Mr. Kinnear, I know that you are the, the newest. You've been baptized in all of this. And I'm sure that Ms. Kakish, uh, like I said, when I first got in, Mr. Fine was very helpful to me that I had no idea all the different colors of money that come into a school district and how you have to handle them. You can spend it here and you can't spend that. But go ahead, uh, Dale. Thank you. Such a great opportunity for uh, for Mays to, to move from chief uh, business officer to superintendent at, at, at Beaumont. Uh, Mays, I, uh, as I said uh, earlier to you, I, I wish you the, the best uh, in your uh, in your new position. Uh, such a uh, again, such a great opportunity. And thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kinnear. And, you know, when, uh, when Dr. Hansen and, and Mr. Keish called me on that Friday afternoon a while back to tell me the news, and I listened, and I think Dr. Hansen thought I was going to be upset, but I did say, you know, David, this is your fault because we asked you to build a bench, and now here's the third one we're losing. But Dr. Hansen, I, I'll leave it with you to finish. And again, the board, I thank you for agreeing to, that we will adjourn in, in Mays Kakish's honor. Yes, a very candid professional. Dr. Hansen. Please finish us out. Thank you, President Hunt. And I'll just add my love, appreciation, and gratitude to you, Mays. I'm so proud of you. But let me not just stop there. Renee, so proud of you. Yes. And Lynn Carmody, so proud of her. Mm -hmm. and in our profession, we need strong female leaders leading up down the state. And I'm excited to see what's going to happen in Beaumont, to Upland, and Riverside Unified as these three sisters of mine go out and take the helm and lead. So proud of all three of you. And of course, can't leave out my dear friend Antonio, but he he's not a female right now. And I'm highlighting the strong females in my life. So congratulations, Renee and Mays and, and Lynn, always you have our best. Have a good Thank day. Thank you, Doc. Thank you, David. I do want to so Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Oh, I should let you say yes. I'm sorry. I just want to thank you all for having me. And I am a better person leaving Riverside than when I came to Riverside. So I just want to thank you. It's been an honor serving you. And you never know our path in the future and how we're going to cross, which boards we're going to sit on or uh, service organizations to continue to serve our community. I'm very proud to have served the six years and I will miss all of you. And I, when I told my wife, she, she cried. So, uh, well, thank you everyone. Uh, Mrs. Alibi, I made the over and under, it's 857. So we got in before nine and I, I won it. So uh, everyone, thank you. And particularly I wanna thank uh, and again, encourage all, all, all the public comments that came in tonight. And uh, we learn from them and we, we grow from them. And uh, so we appreciate that. I'll see everybody on March the 4th. Be careful and please stay safe.